If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. The Awakening of the Lost Baroness by Hazel Linwood Prologue Amanda looked up at the ceiling and smiled to herself, studying the molded cornices and decoration around the edge. It was a beautiful ceiling. Like everything beautiful around her, it was one of the many things that she would never get used to in her new life. She had never imagined anything could be as fine as this house. The thought made her feel a little sad, and she rolled onto her side. The silky coverlet on the bed slipping under her muslin gown. Her mama would have loved to see this place. Would she? Or, would she have been sad that she never had the life I have now? Amanda pushed the idea away. Her mama had been the maid in just such a house possibly. If she thought about it. This very house. She and the baron who owned the estate had fallen in love. And Amanda was the result. Married in secret because his mother had rejected the marriage. Amanda and her mother could never be acknowledged in any legitimate way. The baron had been forced to marry again. And Amanda and her mother had lived in a tiny cottage on the estate. Right at the edge. Amanda had never known who her father was. Until now. Two days after her mother's death. A man had arrived at their cottage on the Foley estate. Saying he wished to speak to her. That had been five years ago now. But Amanda still felt her mother's death keenly. There were still days when she cried for missing her. On that day. She had barely recovered from her mother's death when Mr. Lowry. The butler from the Foley estate. Had arrived and told her the truth of her heritage. And all those years ago, Mr. Lowry brought me to Papa and said I was to live here. She smiled. That part of the story was much better. From being an only child with no father, she had become part of a family. With a sister, a half-sister, and a grandmother as well as a father. Lady Foley had died several years before. Leaving Patricia. Her father's legitimate daughter. Without a mother. It was this family that she had become part of. Stretching, she realized it was two o'clock in the afternoon, which meant that she should be getting ready for afternoon tea. I'll never get used to this. She grinned to herself and went to sit at the dressing table. The looking glass reflected a long, slim face framed with dark hair. She could see her mother's features so clearly. Her wide mouth, delicate bones and large eyes. She wondered if her father's features were as obvious. He had a firm, square-jawed face. And she could see no trace of it in her own. My lady. A call came from the hallway. Distracting her. Oh, Maddie. It's you. Come in. Amanda called cheerfully. Her maid smiling affably, came in. Lady Amanda, will you wear the blue dress for tea today? Muddy asked. Yes, thank you, she replied carefully. I suppose I'll never get used to this. Amanda watched as Maddie combed her hair around a slim piece of wood to try to enhance the natural wave. Amanda had already refused to let anyone use curling tongs on her hair. Something her grandmother criticized. But which she insisted on. I don't like the thought of burning bits of me, just because it's fashionable. She grinned to herself. Growing up outside high society had shown her that fashion was not something to slavishly follow. Another thing it had done was to make her very set in her own ideas and not afraid to air them. There you are, my lady, all done. Maddie said. Now, let's get you into that dress. Amanda nodded. She had scorned the idea of being dressed at first. But after a few attempts to fasten all the buttons down the back of her gown by herself, she had discovered that it helped. There. All done. Maddie nodded approvingly. A few years Amanda's senior, Maddie was very protective. Something which helped a great deal as Amanda found her way around her new existence. Thank you Maddie. Amanda nodded. She looked at herself in the mirror. 
the gown hung down to her ankles from a high waist. The sleeves fashionably puffed, and the neck an oval. The color was a bluish green that brought out the color of her eyes. She smiled, excitement bubbling up inside her. He's coming for tea today. She was just trying to decide if she wanted to wear jewelry when a knock sounded at the door. Amanda? Sister? Are you in? Patricia. Amanda ran to open the door. Amanda, come on. Let's go down. Amanda felt the knot in her stomach tighten, and she smiled at her sister as they headed out of the door as fast as possible. Patricia was dressed in a creamy muslin gown. Her brown hair swept up in an elaborate style. She grinned up at Amanda. Come on. Let's go. The guests are already arriving. Lord Sutcliffe is here too. She smiled coquettishly. Amanda smiled to herself. Patricia was sweet enough, but, in some ways, a little petulant and difficult. But she ascribed that fact to her own presence in the house. Patricia had been raised as the only daughter. And discovering that she was not was naturally difficult and, Amanda thought, inclined to bring out the worst in anyone. She followed Patricia down the stairs into the garden. The tables were set out under the trees decked with cloths, and laden with all kinds of things to eat. The abundance of food was another thing Amanda was fascinated and a little scared by. Even now after all these years. She was just contemplating the sandwiches when she heard footsteps behind her, and she turned around. Good afternoon, Lady Amanda. Lord Sutcliffe said. Seeing his bright blue eyes sparkle, Amanda felt suffused with warmth. She looked away, feeling shy. She liked the wild excitement that she felt whenever she saw him. But it also unsettled her and left her unsure what to do or say. Good afternoon, Lord Sutcliffe. She said. He bowed low and crooked his arm. May I escort you to the bench? He asked. It seems like an age since we last talked. She smiled and nodded and slipped her arm in his and together they crossed the garden. Chapter 1 Amanda walked beside Lord Sutcliffe, feeling her skin tingle with a mix of excitement and wonder. She looked around, listening to his low, rich voice as he talked to her. I do like an outdoor tea party, he said with a smile. The outdoors are so beautiful in the country, and we spend so little time appreciating them. Amanda looked up at him and smiled. Yes. She agreed. That is probably true. He laughed fondly. I suppose that's an ill of society you never really suffered. He said. She nodded. Yes. I spent a lot of time outside high society. She twisted around to look up at him as they headed past one bench and toward another. She felt quite comfortable with him and the fact that he commented on her past didn't bother her in the least. She had always trusted him with that news from the moment they met. That's good. He said lightly. I sometimes think that must be hard. His question was candid, but she was not offended. They had reached a bench, and he took her hand as she sat down. She looked up at him, feeling her heart do that odd skipping movement it seemed to make whenever she was near him. No, not awkward, she said directly. I admit it is difficult, yes, but sometimes I think it is more of a blessing. How so? He asked. She felt his warmth as he sat down beside her and shifted a little to the right, feeling self-conscious. She hoped that wasn't rude. She was never sure what was rude and what was not. Grandmother has such a long list of things that are rude and are not rude. I seldom know where to start thinking about it. Well, I have different things to worry about. She said slowly, trying her best to answer his question. Everyone else in society has these subtle worries. Like whether red printed gowns are truly fashionable. Or whether they ought to tie their cravat just so. Where I worry about big things. Like if I am acceptable at all. She tried to smile, 
but his question had highlighted some painful matters for her. Lady Amanda? He asked. I hope I didn't upset you? Amanda blinked. No. Not at all. Why do you ask? She added, pushing a strand of dark hair out of one green eye. She was sure her voice sounded a little scathing. I thought I had. I'm sorry. It was a foolish question. Lord Sutcliffe was very perceptive. It was one of the things that had struck her from the moment she met him. Not upset. Just thinking. He smiled. I was thinking, too. He said. About the day we first met. Do you remember that? Amanda laughed happily. Of course. I was not sure what was happening. He laughed. I was sure what was happening. He said softly. I just didn't believe it. Amanda frowned at him. She sometimes felt confused when Lord Sutcliffe spoke. Like now. She had not a clue what he was talking about. She recalled the day they had met quite clearly. It was only a month ago, after all. Well, I suppose it was a silly thing to do. Wasn't it? Amanda chuckled. Though it wasn't my fault, you know. She lifted one arched eyebrow. Yes, I know. Lord Sutcliffe said instantly, and he chuckled. I was completely responsible for the incident. I do know that. Not least because you reminded me of the fact. He grinned, showing there was no rancor in his comment. Yes, I did, I suppose. She smiled. She had done more than point out that it was his fault. She had lectured him in no uncertain terms for a good fifteen minutes. She'd been walking on a country path, and he had raced down with his horse, causing her to leap aside or risk being trampled. She considered her anger entirely justified. I am sorry, my lady. He said with a small smile. I still regret it. Amanda laughed. Well, don't. I'm better now. I like walking, so you didn't put me off in the least. That's good. Lord Sutcliffe said gently. Amanda said nothing but stole a sideways glance at him. He seemed a little strange today, now that she thought about it. Normally. He was light-hearted and fun. He seemed to be thinking about something, and it bothered her a little since she didn't know what. Lord Sutcliffe, you aren't worried. Are you? No. He said and smiled fondly at her. Not at all. Sorry if I seemed preoccupied. She shrugged. No matter. Shall we get some tea? I have been meaning to try some of that new chocolate cake for ages. But I don't know if there'll be any left now. No chocolate cake? Why, that would be a horrid shame. Lord Sutcliffe said with a laugh. Come, my lady. Let us seek it out and find it wheresoever it lurks. Amanda had to laugh. That was more like Lord Sutcliffe, as she knew him. Playful and light. She followed him back up to the refreshment table. On the way up, they walked past her father, who was sitting in one of the chairs placed under the trees. He smiled and lifted a friendly hand, a wave. Her grandmother was sitting beside him, looking quite tranquil for once. My father seems a little out of breath. Amanda said to Lord Sutcliffe, pausing before they reached the refreshments. She had been a little worried about him these last few weeks. He had suffered in the heat of early summer and seemed to be red-faced and breathless sometimes. It's the heat, I think. Lord Sutcliffe said. I am sorry you've been worried. Amanda smiled up at him. Oh, Lord Sutcliffe. I haven't been too worried. Just a little. But thank you for your concern. Your worries will always be mine. He said firmly. Thank you. Amanda said lightly. Again, his comment confused her. Why was he so serious today? 
he kept on saying strange things. Feeling preoccupied herself, she reached for a sandwich. It had been left in the sun a little long, and the butter had melted inside it. The melted butter ran down her hand and onto her wrist. Oh, my goodness. She said, feeling her cheeks flush. Her hand was full of melted butter. It was one of those moments she was sure ladies didn't get themselves into. She glanced to see if her grandmother had seen her, but she wasn't looking. Here, let me help. Lord Sutcliffe said and reached into his pocket, pulling out a handkerchief. He dabbed at the butter on her hand and wrist. His touch felt like a soothing warm compress on a wound, and it reached right inside her. Heating her up from the inside out. Oh, thank you. She murmured, feeling self-conscious as she realized she was staring up at Lord Sutcliffe with a rapt expression. Amanda, what is wrong with you? You are behaving strangely. Act like a young lady. If you please. She made herself turn her head and looked away. Should we go back to the bench? She asked. If you like. Lord Sutcliffe said. She had just reached the bench when she recalled the purpose of their departure. They had gone to fetch chocolate cake. She was about to curse herself as a fool for forgetting it when he grinned at her. Here are two slices. Oh. You remembered. That is kind. She went pink. He smiled. Of course I remembered. He said gently. I could never forget something that might please you. Amanda looked at her toes, shyly. When she looked up, his blue ones looked levelly into her own, and she felt a shiver of excitement. Amanda stop it. You are being awfully strange now. She looked away, her heart thumping rapidly in her chest. She didn't understand the effect he had on her. This looks wonderful. He said, looking admiringly down at the cake. It was topped with white icing. And Amanda felt a flush of excitement that had little to do with the cake, and mostly to do with the closeness of Lord Sutcliffe to her. It's a new recipe. She said. The cook first made one just yesterday. It was an experiment, so none of us ate any, but Maddie told me about it afterwards. Maddie is your maid? he asked. She nodded. Yes. She's about my age, and she lives on the farm down Heathford Way. She said, pointing down toward the neighboring village. She realized she was probably doing something a lady wouldn't do. Both gesturing with a plate of cake and discussing her maid's living conditions. She looked at her lap. She sounds like a nice person. Lord Sutcliffe said. Amanda felt surprised. Of all the people she had met so far, and she had met many. Nobody, with the exception of her father, understood when she talked about servants as real people. Yes, she is, very. She said. It is good, isn't it? Lord Sutcliffe said as he ate. I've a mind to ask your cook to give my cook the recipe. He laughed. Amanda smiled up at him. He had such a good heart. He also had such a simple view of the world. He was a good person. He had also never questioned the society into which he had been born, simply accepting it all as normal. Having cooks and servants. And assuming that every earl was as generous and kind as his father. I am glad for him that he has never had to think about what it would be like if life was different. She looked around. The guests had all arrived, and the lawn was in contrast to dresses in a dozen pastel shades. As ladies and gentlemen stood about in groups or alone. She listened to the laughter and wondered if any of them had ever questioned what made them different to the people who poured drinks or carried trays for them. I have a mind to go riding tomorrow. Lord Sutcliffe said in a moment, distracting her from her thoughts. Or, even better. Why don't we have a long walk and maybe a game of lawn billiards? He asked, looking across at her. Amanda frowned. You want me to come with you? She asked. Lord Sutcliffe laughed. Of course. 
Lady Amanda, would you like to accompany me on a very long walk? Amanda laughed with delight. I would be happy to. She said. She felt her own mood brighten. She looked around the garden and, suddenly, she was not noticing the people and how different she felt from them. Instead, she saw the light on the lawn and how beautiful it was. Like another world, only I am the one who has changed, while it is the same. She smiled to herself. When she was with Lord Sutcliffe, it always seemed to her that the world was better. Well, then? Lord Sutcliffe said, shifting in his seat. I look forward to a lovely long walk tomorrow. Amanda smiled up at him fondly. And I too, Lord Sutcliffe. It will be fun. She smiled to herself, coloring faintly. A lady would say diverting or delightful. She would most certainly not say fun. But then, she wasn't a lady. Not really. She was Amanda Johnson. Daughter of Sarah Johnson. And she had always felt that was enough to be. They spent the rest of the afternoon talking and laughing together. When the guests had departed and the family had gone inside, sitting in the drawing room before dinner to relax. Grandmother descended on Amanda. Lord Sutcliffe talked to you all afternoon. She said neutrally. Amanda frowned at her. What did her grandmother mean by that? I assure you, we were only talking about riding and things. She said. Was there really something unusual about the way she and Lord Sutcliffe were talking? Was it possible to interpret it in another way? Mmm. Was all her grandmother said. Amanda looked away, feeling unsure what to say next. Before she could think of anything, she caught sight of her sister, Patricia. She was looking at her with the most peculiar expression. Dark and angry. When she caught her gaze on her, she looked away. Grandmother? Amanda said faintly hoping her grandmother could shed some light on her sister's apparent ire. Had she inadvertently done something? But grandmother was already in the hallway, talking with the butler. Amanda took a long breath and went to find her sister. Patricia? She asked nervously. How was your afternoon at the tea? Oh, it was splendid. Patricia said, sounding a little too bright, almost as if she forced it. And did you see my new bonnet? Papa ordered it for me. It's pale pink. But a darker pink than the daytime one. I think the roses on it will match my new ball gown so well. Amanda nodded but still felt confused. She knew something had been bothering Patricia. And the comment about the bonnet seemed almost defensive somehow. Amanda looked away. She was worried about having upset her sister but she couldn't let it take away all her enjoyment of the afternoon. Or spoil the walk she was already looking forward to. She couldn't wait to see Lord Sutcliffe again. Chapter 2 Henry nodded to his manservant and headed down the hallway. He had dressed carefully in his new brown suit, and he felt well dressed and ready for a long walk. He walked past the parlour, feeling the warm sunshine flooding in through the windows. He had taken breakfast alone, and he was pleased to see his mother, Lady Sutcliffe, sitting in the parlour, sewing. Mama. Good day. A fine morning. He smiled. He felt light and energised by thoughts of the day. Yes. His mother said, laying aside her sewing. She fixed him with pale blue eyes. It is a fine morning. I hope you'll be here at lunchtime. Why is that? Henry asked. He was sure he was free for the day. I'm having a luncheon, and I invited Lord and Lady Foley and Patricia. His mother said. Mother. You didn't tell me. Patricia was wealthy, well-raised, and beautiful. She was also disinterested in anything outside fashion, wealth and the trappings of fortune. She was also Lady Amanda's half-sister. He found her difficult, petulant, and frankly unkind. And of course, 
there was the obvious difficulty that she was the sister of the woman in whom he truly was interested. Well, I'm telling you now. I suppose any arrangements you have made may be cancelled. She asked, putting her head on one side and regarding him interestedly. Henry stepped back. Mother? No, they cannot be. I planned a walk in the country and a lawn billiards afternoon, and I invited about a dozen people. One of whom is the sister of Lady Patricia. That could be so awkward for them both. Oh, Henry. His mother looked away. How could you? Well, there's nothing for it then. We shall have to hold both events together. I suppose the Foley's can be safely included in your lawn billiards tournament? She raised a brow. Mother, now, look here. Henry began. Yes, we can include them. But, Mother, I must insist that you stop trying to maneuver things between me and Patricia. I have nothing to talk to Patricia about. We can't hold a conversation. Well, I'm sure there is something. And in any case, you can spend all your days out hunting while she's in the house. I don't see a lack of conversation as a barrier for you. She reached for her sewing dismissively. Mother Henry looked away. He had no idea what to say to that. He knew his mother had a very cynical view on most things, but he himself had bigger hopes for his life. His mother would be happy with him living miserably if he kept his title and expanded their fortunes. And Lady Patricia certainly had a large dowry. Henry struggled not to lose his temper. He looked back at his mother and took a deep breath. Mother, I am quite happy to have the Foley's along as part of the walk. And the lawn billiards, or whatever they wish to do in the afternoon. But I must ask that you do not insist on my focusing on Patricia. I find I have nothing in common with her. I do not see why I should not make my choice in this matter. His mother shut her eyes. Henry, my dearest. I know you might not like Patricia, but you cannot always have what you want. I think it is my fault for indulging you so. Henry looked at her in astonishment. Mother? You know I will always do my best for our house. But I cannot lie, and what you ask me to do is to go against what I know to be the truth. I do not like her, and I know that I will not be able to make myself do, either. His mother looked almost convinced, and he decided he would do best to make an exit now. After all, he was used to her capitulating to what he wanted sooner or later. He bowed and wished her a good day and speedily left before she could argue further. He shut his eyes, letting thoughts of Amanda fill his mind. Her sweet face, her quick wit, and her beautiful green eyes. He felt his heart grow warm just thinking of her, and he knew without a doubt that he was falling in love with her. He could not wait to see her that afternoon. He headed back to the house, feeling cheered considerably. He was going to see Amanda, and that meant that all was wonderful. When he went down to welcome the guests, his mother was standing near the entrance. He nodded to her but tried not to let her ruffle him despite her long-suffering expression. He was going to enjoy the afternoon. Lord Harlan and Lady Emily. The butler announced. Henry went over to greet them, smiling in his usual friendly way. He was expecting almost a dozen more guests. But the main person he was looking forward to seeing was, of course, Amanda. Lady Amanda and her sister, Lady Patricia. The butler finally announced. The two ladies appeared on the doorstep. With an older woman in a maid's uniform in tow as a chaperone. As the ladies went up the steps, the maid discreetly blended in with the rest of the staff. Henry drew a breath and he could not look away from Lady Amanda. Dressed in a long muslin gown of white with a green band around the skirt, she looked more beautiful than anyone he had even imagined. Lady Amanda, he said. He bowed and then looked up into her eyes. Her gaze met his and, for a moment, he felt as if he was in another place altogether. Good afternoon. Lady Patricia giggled. He turned and smiled at her, and she beamed up coquettishly. Henry thought she was shy after all.
His father had hinted that he should court Lady Patricia. And he was sure she had heard the same. When he came back to the door, his mother was looking at him with annoyance written on her features. He looked away and turned to the guests who were crowding the door. Lord Grantham and Lady Jessica. He greeted them and then looked up as his mother greeted the Foley's. When he had finished greeting the guests, he went into the parlour. He looked around and instantly spotted Lady Amanda. Nodding to the rest of the guests, always friendly. He went to stand beside her and Patricia. I'm so pleased you are here. He said honestly. I want to show you the new rose garden. Amanda smiled at him and he felt his heart melt. At that moment, he wasn't aware of anything else in the room or anywhere else. All he knew about or cared about was in those green eyes. He heard Patricia make a small noise of surprise and realized his mother was coming toward him. He cleared his throat, remembering he had to welcome everybody. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. He greeted them warmly. Welcome to our garden party and afternoon walk. We will start off here, in the parlor, with refreshment. Then, we'll take a long walk about the estate and return here for more refreshment and a turn around the lawn, if we so wish. Laughter followed. Friendly and affirming. And Henry let out a sigh of relief. He had at least managed to get that part of it right. Would you like some tea? He asked Lady Amanda, immediately focusing his attention on her again. We have a very fine Chinese tea here. I find it milder than the ones from India. Amanda smiled and nodded. Well, I would be pleased to try it. He glanced over and saw his mother looking at him furiously and decided it would be best to move out into the garden. Henry let the faster walkers go first heading off at a good pace up the pathway toward the fields around the back of the estate. He walked toward the back of the crowd, where Lady Amanda stood with her sister. May I accompany you? He said. Amanda raised a brow. Since I don't know my way around the garden, it would be most kind. He laughed and they shared a smile. They walked near the back, which meant that the rest of the party was soon far ahead. He looked down at Lady Amanda and felt his spirits lift. I was very pleased you came today. He said softly. Lady Patricia had caught up with a party of guests just ahead of them, and they were walking alone at the back. She looked up at him and smiled. Of course. I like your company. He felt breathless suddenly. He had not expected her to say something so direct. Of course, he reminded himself, she was not raised to hide the truth. Well, then, he said, feeling awkward. We, um, I mean, I. He shook his head and smiled awkwardly. Sorry. Amanda looked up at him as if she wasn't at all sure what had possessed him. What is it? She asked with a little smile. Just, um. Just wondering if you wanted to walk farther or if we should sit in the arbor a while? Amanda stared at him. He could understand her surprise. After all, he had invited a dozen people to the house. And now he was inviting her to sit with him in the arbor. He looked at his feet, feeling awkward. Um, or we could go and join the rest? I think they've gone on ahead without us. Oh, yes. Amanda nodded and he wondered if, like himself, she'd only just noticed the absence of the other guests. Well, I suppose we should go ahead and catch up. She said. Yes. He nodded. I suppose we should. They fell into step together. He paused at the arbor gate, feeling his heart miss a beat. He wanted to ask her to come and have a look at it. To show her his bench under the trees his favorite place for sitting. It looked right out over the fields, and on a summer afternoon, it was a splendid place to sit. Um, Lady Amanda, are you sure you don't want to sit? She smiled up at him. She looked gently amused, and he felt his insides not with a mix of happiness and nerves. We really should go. 
she said. Of course. He fell into step beside her. But not without suddenly being acutely aware of her presence and the fact that they were alone together at the back of the crowd. Everyone else was far ahead. He could smell the scent of her skin. Rose water and a soft floral smell he couldn't identify. He felt his body heat up, and he longed to kiss her. But he was aware of how nervous she was, and how much she wanted to behave in a decent manner. Also, I have no idea if she thinks of me that way or not. He looked away, a mix of delight and confusion washing through him. They walked on to catch up with the others. There you are. Lady Patricia said. I was just looking for you. Are we going all the way to the fields there? She asked Henry lightly. Henry nodded, cheeks flushing. He wondered if she had speculated about what he and Amanda were up to. Looking at her open expression, he was fairly sure she hadn't. In any case, he reminded himself. They had really done nothing. Just walked together at the back of the group. Yes. He nodded, addressing her question. We'll go all the way there. Amanda smiled up at him as they fell into step again. You're very good at organizing things. She said. Am I? He asked, going red. I mean, thank you, Lady Amanda. I am most gratified you think so. He looked down at her and saw she was smiling. He felt his heart grow light with happiness. He winced as he thought about how angry his mother would be with him for spending the afternoon with Amanda. He pushed the thought away, deciding not to let it spoil a beautiful afternoon. During the walk back, he decided to try focusing some attention on the other guests. He had caught several people staring at him and had chosen to mingle with the rest rather than let his affection for Amanda be too obvious to everyone. The moment they reached the house, however, he felt a mischievous smile lift his lips. Lady Amanda was standing with a staff for lawn billiards in one hand, and he couldn't resist going to join her. You are playing with the red team? He asked, gesturing at the ball before her. Which was marked with red. I am. She said. Oh. Well, I will play the blue. He took up a ball from the corresponding pile. The blue ball would oppose the red. As you wish. She said lightly. He grinned. He realized as they went to take the field that he was probably being unfair. After all, she would not have had any opportunity to learn to play lawn billiards. Are you ready? His father, who had taken up the role of overseeing the game quite naturally, asked as they walked onto the lawn. Henry looked around, wishing he could change his mind and walked back off the field again. Yes. Right. Then. Begin. His father declared with a flourish the moment Amanda had spoken. He gestured to her. The Reds have the first go. Henry stood aside and let Amanda shoot the ball through the hoops. He felt a surge of guilt and he wished he hadn't chosen to play against her. He was about to suggest they change over. He would swap with Lord Harlan or anybody else. But then she hit the ball. It sailed through the first hoop. She looked at him, one brow raised. He had to smile. The look was so plainly a challenge. He found he was enjoying it. He stood back, still laughing, and watched her shoot the ball through the second hoop, and the third. The fourth was the hardest and he stood, his heart in his mouth, waiting for her to hit it. It sailed straight through. He grinned and suppressed his urge to cheer as she walked off the field again. She walked with a distinct swagger and turned and grinned at him. He was grinning back when he caught sight of his mother in the crowd watching. She looked angry and he looked hastily away. Recalling that everyone could see him, he drew his attention away from Amanda and to his father who was standing waiting to announce the next step in the proceedings. Ready? He asked Henry. And? Go. 
Henry readied himself to take the first shot. It was the easiest of the course, and he looked up to see her watching him. He smiled, feeling a strange tingling sensation through his body. He struck the ball and it went through. He relaxed slightly. She was grinning, and he thought she had a distinctly self-satisfied expression as he lined up with the second hoop. He thought she looked so beautiful that it almost distracted him from taking aim. The ball went through, but perilously close to the hoop itself. He let out a breath he hadn't known he was holding. He went to take a shot at the third hoop, and the ball hit against the side with a distinct ping and ricocheted off into the corner of the lawn. He stared at it, and then, as he saw her laugh, he couldn't help smiling. She was radiant with delight and he rejoiced to see her so happy. He had never enjoyed a win half as much as he enjoyed losing to her. Just because it made her happy. He handed his staff to the next player and couldn't resist going over to smile at her. You played well, my lady. He said. She raised a brow. We did play something similar in the village, you know. She said mildly. Lawn billiards might be a fancy thing, but hitting a ball with a stick is a fairly ordinary game. He couldn't help laughing. He had to admit she was right. He bowed low. My lady, I must agree. And your skill is impressive. I must say. You didn't do too terribly, either. They looked at each other and grinned. He knew he was doing everything he shouldn't be, but he didn't care. He was happy and he couldn't take his eyes off Amanda. He knew tomorrow he would have to face his mother's ire. But at that moment, he was simply enjoying himself too much to worry much for tomorrow. Chapter 3 Amanda looked up at Lord Sutcliffe and drew in a startled breath. She smiled and flushed as she caught that blue-eyed gaze on her. She wondered what he was thinking. He has been very strange of late. She couldn't quite fathom what it was that was making him behave in such an odd way. He was jumpy and flustered like she had never seen him. My lady, have you seen the trees up there? He asked, pointing across the valley, to where a copse of oak trees stood. Um, not up close, no, Amanda said with a frown. Oh, well, they're quite remarkable. They grow in almost a perfect circle, and in the center is a lovely quiet clearing. I vouch it would be a fine place to picnic, should one wish to take refreshment outdoors. I would imagine so. Amanda nodded. They walked on quietly. They had caught up with the group for a while. Amanda noted, but then had allowed them to head off again, sinking to the back. She was sure that the rest of the party were at the fields by now. And she wanted to say something to Lord Sutcliffe, but he had stopped again looking off to his right. What is it? She asked, frowning up at him. I was just recalling when I was a boy. And I used to ride here with my tutor. He said. Mr. Repworth, my riding instructor, that was. We spent hours going down that path until I was sure I could ride past water without my horse shying away. I see. Amanda nodded. It must have taken quite a long time. About two weeks. He nodded. He smiled at her. You also had to do that? No. She said, frowning as she tried to think back. My own riding lessons were not that comprehensive. I suppose I learned it only as a kind of accomplishment not because anyone thought I would really be using it. She felt herself frown. That's silly, he said, sounding vehement. I see no reason why young ladies shouldn't ride as much as they want. I enjoy riding, and I can only imagine that you would take as much delight in it as I would. I don't see that it matters that you're a girl. She laughed. You know, I wanted to say that, too, she said. She looked up at him and her spirits lifted. He was such a nice person. Unlike most of the people she met, he didn't seem to care about breeding or society or anything. 
He was different than the others, and she felt a strange tingle in her belly as he looked down at her. A smile crinkling the corners of his eyes. I am glad. I hope you are always happy to speak your mind to me. Amanda frowned up at him. His eyes were sparkling, and he was looking at her in that specific way. One he'd only started using within the last week or two. It made her tingle inside and she wished she knew what it meant. I always feel at ease with you. She admitted. He sounded relieved when he replied. I am glad, my lady. She smiled up at him, feeling confused. Oh. He said as if he had only just noticed. The party has got far ahead of us, have they not? We'd do better to turn back and simply wait for them than go all the way. We'd catch them just as they turned around. Amanda frowned. Mayhap, you're right. She agreed. It's been about an hour already. They'll probably be coming back soon. An hour? He asked. Yes. The sun moved about a hand's breadth to the west since we started. He laughed. That's capital. You know so many things nobody else of my acquaintance would know. She went red. That's because, well, because of... Because you come from another world. He said with a smile. She felt his words settle on exactly the spot that hurt the most inside her and soothed the ache there. She had been re-educated, tolerated and openly mocked. She had not yet been accepted or appreciated. He was the first person to express her beginnings so eloquently. I suppose, yes. She said softly. He smiled down at her, and together they walked back toward the house. They were walking back the same way, when he suggested they take a shortcut. It led to a place in the path where a stream crossed. Clearly overshooting its bank as the result of the previous rain. Here. He said and took her hand. If you hold on to me, you can safely step across. Thank you. She whispered, going bright red as his hand took hers. His skin was warm and soft, and his touch made her fingers tingle. A slow heat going up her arm and into her heart. Of course. He said softly. He was looking at the ground, and she thought his cheeks were flushed, too. His eyes shiny. But she dismissed that thought as silly. Why would they be? He kept holding her hand. When they were both on the other bank, he gently ran his thumb over her wrist. A feeling that made her blood pulse faster. He looked down into her eyes as he did it. She felt joy wash through her body, warming her from her toes to her head. He let go and looked at his feet. My lady, forgive me. He murmured. His voice sounded odd. Too like his throat was too tight for it. Of course. She said, cheeks reddening. They walked side by side, wordless, back to the garden. When they reached the lawns where the tables had been, they found that the food had been cleared away. As had the chairs and tea things. Men in dark uniforms were busy clearing away the last of the things as they arrived. Well, looks like we're in time for a game of lawn billiards. If we want. He said with a small laugh. She looked up with a smile. Can we play with only two people? Yes. He said. Again, his eyes held hers. It was only an instant. But she felt his gaze as if he had touched her and her body tingled. Heart skipping a beat. Amanda looked around. He seemed nervous and she wondered why. He was talking to a tall man with white hair in a dark suit. And she saw the man nodding. They were standing under the trees, and she guessed he was the butler. And Lord Sutcliffe was instructing him to move the tables now. She watched him from the slight distance. His tall form was slightly bent as he spoke. His broad shoulders held at a slant. She found her cheeks going pink as she let her eye rove from his feet to his head. Noting how lithe and well built he was. Amanda. Ladies certainly don't notice things like that. 
she felt her cheeks going pink. What would her grandmother say? Would you like to have a look at the garden? We have acquired wonderful new species of iris in the flower garden. Which I know would win your interest. Amanda smiled and fell into step behind him. She wanted to say that she appreciated plants in a different way to him. Just admiring their beauty. Without needing to collect or classify them. But she was sure he wouldn't understand, and besides, she liked the fact that he wanted to share them with her. They walked slowly into the flower garden. Amanda breathed in the scent of the flowers, which lifted her spirits. It was like another world. Scented and shaded and remarkable. Tall hedges grew around floral beds, and climbing roses breathed their scent down long stone pathways. Benches were set out discreetly under the trees, and Lord Sutcliffe walked ahead of her. Between beds of fragrant plants. Pointing out new ones to either side of him. And this is a new iris from France. Mother asked Lady Epstone for a bulb or two. They are a rare variety in such a pale color, are they not? He asked, pointing down at a flower that was so pale lilac it was almost blue. They are very beautiful. Yes. He replied, and he was staring at her. She felt her cheeks flush. He stepped forward and she stepped forward and, before she knew what had happened, he had taken her hand in his own. He was looking into her eyes and she felt breathless. Out there, on the path. She hadn't understood his gestures and glances. Here, alone, they felt different. He feels something like in the French novels Patricia likes reading. She felt her cheeks flush. She felt the same way, she realized. How had she not noticed? My lord. A voice interrupted them. Lord Sutcliffe turned as the butler came into the garden. He stepped abruptly back. Yes? My lord. All is ready for the lawn billiards. And your guests just arrived. Oh. Henry colored. Perdition. The guests. Coming, right along. He nodded to the butler and then turned to Amanda. Excuse me, he said softly. I must hurry away. Of course. She murmured. She waited until he had left, and then, slowly, followed him out of the garden. The guests had indeed arrived. They were massed on the side of the lawn where the chairs had been. And nobody saw her slip out of the garden and into the back of the group. Whoever wants to play lawn billiards, come here and join me. Henry said. He gestured to the front of the group. We can organize two teams, at least. Who wants to play? Some people started to step forward. Amanda decided to wait out the first round. She was tired and decided to sit and watch. As she followed the group down to where the hoops were set out for the game, she noticed Lady Sutcliffe staring at her with so much hostility it made her shiver. She wondered what she had done to offend the woman. She looked again, but Lady Sutcliffe had moved. She was left with only a vague memory of her. And the unsettled feeling the look left her with. The afternoon was spent on lawn billiards and sandwiches. And Amanda enjoyed it thoroughly. Which surprised her. She went down to the carriage with Patricia when the afternoon was concluded. Feeling relaxed and happy. She felt wrapped in sweet sensations. And she wished she could talk to someone about the wonderful feelings in her heart. She looked out of the coach and watched the country go by. Feeling beautiful happiness filling her up inside. She knew she would see Lord Sutcliffe very soon. Chapter 4 Henry walked back over the lawn, looking at the patches of grass flattened by guests, chairs and playing on the lawn. He took a deep breath, chest tight with worry. As he headed back toward the house. He knew his mother would be furious with him, and he understood why. He could even feel sympathy with her. Though he would not budge on his position. He knew she would be embarrassed in front of the Foley's, and he knew that he would have to try and put it to rights. But he was determined to follow his own will in the matter. As he headed into the drawing room, he smiled. 
he had a sudden flash of memory. Where Lady Amanda looked up at him and he could so easily have kissed her cheek. He felt his face flush. Lord Sutcliffe? The housekeeper said, distracting him. Yes? He glanced at Mrs. Romney and felt his heart tense. Just wondering what to do about dinner. Will it be at the usual time, my lord? Um, yes. Henry said, surprised anyone asked him. He was used to his father organizing all that. He headed out into the hallway and on up the stairs. It was only after he dressed for dinner, and was going back down to the drawing room to fetch a book that he saw his mother. She didn't look angry. Just upset. Son. I don't know what to say. She said to him. Henry shut his eyes. I know, mother. I know. I am aware I embarrassed you. Son. You can't begin to describe how you made me feel. She said firmly. Her blue eyes, paler than his, held his own. You made things terribly awkward, and I hope you are going to do something about it. Mother, I apologize. He said, feeling his stomach twist. I would like to make it up to you in whatever way I can. Well. She sniffed. You can begin by taking a gift to Lady Patricia. I am sure I have just the thing in the pantry. Some bonbons ought to do it. And you can invite her here for the ball. She looked at him as if that should be quite clear. What? Henry stared at her. She frowned. What? I am giving you a chance to get out of it. You can be a real fool, Henry. But you're lucky that I'm expert at sorting out messes. Mother. Henry said again. She was already turning away. What, son? She asked, turning to look back at him. She was looking at him as if he was mad. Whatever is the matter? Mother, I didn't ask you to fix up any mess. I am perfectly aware of what I did. And I intended to leave matters as they are. As far as I am concerned, there is no mess. I have made my choice. You're a fool, Henry. His mother snapped. You are ruining plans I took months to make. She turned away and headed back down the hallway. Plans for my life. Plans I never asked for. Henry burst out. He was not accustomed to shouting at anyone or losing his temper. But her sharp words struck him as remarkably thoughtless. She looked at him with wide eyes and he instantly regretted it. Don't shout at me. She sniffed, and Henry considered she might cry. Sorry, mother. He said. It still stands that I do not want you to make arrangements on my behalf. I am quite able to find young ladies to court. I would prefer you to leave that side of matters up to me and trust that I will make a suitable choice. He turned away and he thought he had won when she said nothing. He hadn't thought she was going to play her winning card. The one she always used. You're irresponsible, Henry. You are meant to secure an heir for the earldom. And you're thirty years old already. Henry shut his eyes. He turned around and looked at her. Mother, that is not necessary. He said tightly. His mother just looked at him. Her expression was one of a tutor who has seen his charge make the same mistake half a dozen times and is fast running out of tolerance. You are the heir to a noble house, son. She said lightly. You do not have a choice. Henry realized that he was going to make no progress this way. She wasn't listening, and all he was doing was becoming strident. He turned and walked out of the room. He hadn't consciously looked for his father but his feet somehow took him in the direction of the drawing room, where he found his father. Son. Capital afternoon. Care for a walk with me tomorrow? His father called to him as he walked past. Henry let out a long breath of relief. His father could help him in this matter. Father. 
He walked over to join him. Um, are you busy? No, no. He smiled. I was going to fill my pipe and go out to the terrace. Care to accompany me? I know you don't smoke. His father added with a chuckle. Thank you, father. Henry said. He fell into step beside him and they went out onto the terrace together. Had a good afternoon? His father asked, taking a puff on his pipe. It was a grand day for a walk. When I was your age, I did love walking. Walked all day, I did. He smiled. His blue eyes looked wistful and Henry felt a mix of love and sorrow for him. I'm sure, father. He said. You still could, I'm sure. His father was sixty-eight and not particularly well. He and Lady Sutcliffe had been old for parents. Henry knew they had lost many pregnancies before he was finally born, and that they had rejoiced when he had been healthy and strong. It was a position that made it hard to refuse them anything. It also made getting an heir so much more imperative. No, son. His father said and winced as he sat down slowly. My back won't be happy doing that. A pox on it. He grimaced, leaning back. Physician says I shouldn't ride more than half an hour a day. I felt like giving him a good talking to, but he's right. He sighed. Yes. Henry agreed. They sat in silence for a while. Henry looked over at that peaceful face. So like his own. They had the same square jaw, the same nose, and he could see around his father's mouth and eyes the wrinkles he would one day have. Smiling eyes. Father is never angry about anything. He took a deep breath. Father. I wanted to ask. Is it about your mother? He asked with a soft chuckle. I thought she wanted to have words with you. He grinned. I can always tell when she's in a bad mood. Father. Mama has these plans, and. He didn't know how to begin. His father always supported his mother, no matter what. Father, she wants me to marry a woman not of my choosing. Son, life is a strange thing. He said softly. I can't tell you what to do. But I can tell you that you'll break your mother's heart if you go against her. She's got great plans for you. And an ambitious mother is no bad thing, hey? He chuckled and patted Henry's hand warmly. And you know I'm not young. Father. Henry looked away. He was using exactly the same argument his mother had. He wanted to scream. Not because he was angry at the unfairness but because he knew they were right. Come, son. I can talk to her for you, eh? Best if we go together. I understand you don't approve her choice. No. Henry agreed. I don't. He nodded. Well, let's see what we can do. They went in as soon as his father was ready. He felt hopeful that he would be able to help as he followed him into the drawing room. Ah. Adeline, my dear. His father said, taking a seat at the head of the table in the drawing room. Henry and I were just talking, and... I know, and I want you to know my mind is set. She said firmly. I knew he would try to convince you otherwise. But I know what's best for this household. She sniffed. You know Lord Foley is a good friend of yours, and... I understand, Ardeline. His father said gently. But, don't you think it would be fair to let Henry, well, broaden his experience? After all, we are out in the country. You mean, a trip to town? His mother brightened. Yes. His father agreed. And then Henry can have a chance to broaden his prospects, shall we say? There are so many wealthy families there. So many more than we can meet by staying in this place. Father. Henry stared, not knowing what to say. This was, in many ways, 
even worse than he had expected. He would rather have stayed here, where he could make his own choices. Rather than whisked away to London where even letters back home would take three days to be delivered, post haste. Hush, son. His father said, and Henry felt as if he'd been slapped. I can't do more than that. You need to broaden your outlook, and that is that. He sounded firm. He looked across at Lady Sutcliffe, who nodded. I won't give up on Patricia Foley. But you have one season, son, just one. To prove me wrong. Henry looked from his mother, the jewels at her throat blinking in the candlelight, to his father, and stood up slowly. He felt his head reeling with disbelief. He turned around and walked out. Upstairs, he slammed the door and sat down on the bed. His head in his hands. Dash it. He swore. He locked the door so his manservant couldn't walk in unannounced and sat down at his desk. Trying to think. He knew his father meant well. But he also knew that he'd never stopped seeing him as a small boy. Someone to be indulged and tolerated but not really understood. He was sure his father thought he was offering him a good thing. Just as he would have when he was five years old and he brought him a model carriage. I need to speak to them about Lady Amanda. He let out his breath slowly. He would have done so ages ago, save that his father and mother seemed to already know about his affection for her. And had cautiously skirted the issue. They cannot see past her origins, and I know that. And I don't want to hear them say it. He shut his eyes and wished that he cared less about them. That he could live with himself if he upset them. He knew they had waited many years to bear him. And that they wanted what was best for him. He also knew that their health was delicate, and he hesitated to upset them. He knew all too well that a sudden rage could afflict either of them with some terrible bout of ill health. An idea occurred to him. Lord Foley, Amanda's father, was acquainted with his own father. If he could speak with her father, maybe he could help to explain matters more gently. He smiled to himself. It was obvious. He couldn't believe he hadn't thought of it before. All he needed to do was ask permission to court her, and let Lord Foley and his father settle the rest. He felt his cheeks redden at the idea. It meant he would need to confess his love for Amanda. He would do that as soon as he possibly could. Chapter 5 Amanda heard feet in the hallway and looked up to see Patricia go past. She looked like she was dressed for riding, and, since she didn't stop past to say anything, Amanda looked down again. She was stitching a sampler of cross-stitch. Her grandmother said it was an important part of her education. She put it aside. Grandmother would come and inspect it soon. And Amanda knew it wasn't going to meet with her approval. Simply because she wasn't very good at cross-stitch. She would much rather have been reading, and preferred newspapers and books that informed her. Or were at least exciting. I wonder where Grandmother is? It was odd that she wasn't in the drawing room by now. She had insisted that Amanda be there so that they could discuss the work while her grandmother worked on her own fine tapestry. It was something they did every third day of the week. She didn't relish the idea. But Amanda was starting to worry that grandmother wasn't there yet. Grandmother still hadn't appeared by the time the clock struck the hour, and Amanda laid her work aside and stood up to go and look for her. My lady. The butler asked. I just received a card from a guest. He's downstairs. Shall I tell him to come upstairs instead? Amanda raised a brow. She held out a hand to take the card. Oh, yes, please ask him to step in at once, Mr. Lowry, she nodded. Why would Lord Sutcliffe call at this hour? She went pink. Her grandmother really ought to be here. Or somebody who could act as a chaperone. She looked around. And please. Fetch my maid, please. She added to the butler, who was still in the doorway. Of course, my lady. He said affably. Amanda felt relieved when Maddie came in. She went to stand in the corner and. 
just as Amanda stood up again from the chair. He walked in. Lady Amanda. He greeted, bowing low. I had to come to speak with you today. Lord Sutcliffe. She said, frowning as she lifted up from her curtsy. What was he visiting at this hour for? And what was worrying him so? I know it is unseemly, but might I ask you to accompany me to the garden on a walk? He asked. Of course, you are welcome to bring your maid. Thank you. She said, and looked sideways at Maddie. Please, come with us. Maddie followed them out, keeping a few paces behind to allow them some sense of privacy. Lord Sutcliffe seemed terse and stressed and Amanda wondered what was bothering him. She felt relieved when they were out in the fresh air of the garden. My lady, he said, as they headed into the flower garden. The scent of iris is strong on the air there. I had to come to speak with you alone. You mentioned that, Amanda said, frowning up at him. He was more nervous than she had ever expected he would be. She wondered what was bothering him. Indeed, I did. He nodded. Well, I wish to say something very important. He said. He looked at her, and he swallowed hard. She felt her brow wrinkled with confusion. What was the matter with him? What is it, Lord Sutcliffe? She asked. I wish to tell you that I admire you enormously, and hold you in high affection. He said. She stared at him. He spoke so quickly, she wasn't sure what he'd said. And when the meaning sank into her head she stared at him in shock. My lord. I didn't know you felt that. It was a revelation. Suddenly, the peculiar way he had been behaving all for the last week or so finally made sense. She stared at him and felt profound relief. She could feel other emotions on the edge of it. Delight, wonderment. But right now, all she felt was relief. I trust you're not shocked? He asked. He looked slightly upset, and she realized that he thought she wasn't pleased. No. Of course I'm pleased. She said quickly. I mean, Lord Sutcliffe, you mean a great deal to me. He stared at her. Evidently, the thought that she might feel something similar for him in return was a surprise. She felt her heart warm to him and walked over to stand in front of him. She was close enough to see the wrinkle by his mouth and the flutter of a steady pulse. You mean, you return my affection? She smiled up at him hearing how haltingly he asked her. She did care a great deal for him. Of course, I do. She said gently. You surely must have noticed by now? He smiled, though she thought his eyes were a little sad. You mean, you like to talk to me and walk together and discuss things? He asked hesitantly. She smiled. I mean I like you to talk to, and walk with. And I like you in other ways, too. Oh, did he have to make her say that? She looked at her boot toes, feeling awkward. It was only after she had said it that she realized it was true. She should have understood what those tingles of excitement, the joy she felt on mentioning him, actually indicated. She was falling in love with him. She looked up and found him looking down at her. His eyes held hers and his lips lifted in a tentative smile. She looked at her feet and her cheeks reddened with a blush. My lady, you do me great honor. He murmured. Amanda glowed. She smiled up at him and he smiled at her. My lord. Forgive me for being so hesitant to understand what it was I felt. She said softly. I just. I know. He smiled. It took me a while to understand, too. But now I know it must be so, and I am so happy. Amanda reached out a hand to take his. She felt joyful in a way she had never imagined before. And when she looked around the garden it seemed to her as if it had transformed into a magical place. She beamed at him and he took her hand. She felt her skin tingle as he rested his fingers on hers. 
She had never felt a touch that did that before. She looked into his eyes and she couldn't look away. He bent down and lifted her hand to his lips. She felt the soft brush of his lip on her hand, and the warmth of his mouth. It was only a second. But the feeling raced from her fingers and up her arm to fizzle its way through her body. She smiled and he smiled back. Lord Sutcliffe, I should mention this to my papa. She said softly. She could only imagine he would be glad. She thought he had mentioned some plans regarding Patricia, and she wanted to make sure he wasn't cross. Oh, yes. Of course. He nodded. And it is my duty to do so too. I would like to court you, my lady. I must insist on speaking with him. Let me go to him first? Amanda asked. She smiled up at him. It should be quick. Then, of course, I will call you and you may talk too. He laughed. Well, I hope you hurry and talk to him, then. He grinned. Amanda nodded and started to walk back to the house. Just then, she spotted her grandmother's maid, Christy. She was running desperately. She almost forgot to breathe. What was wrong? Had something happened? Was grandmother hurt? My lady. The woman shouted. My lady. Come at once. What is it? Amanda asked, her heart thudding. Is it the baroness? Did she fall? What happened? She imagined her grandmother lying on the path, maybe with a broken leg, maybe having been struck by some terrible pain. It's your father. He? Amanda felt herself sway. She stumbled forward, then started to run. Beside her, Lord Sutcliffe started to run too. Together they headed down the path. She stopped short as she encountered her grandmother. She was walking up the path slowly, and when she saw them she stopped. Grandmother? She asked. As she neared, she saw how strained and pale she was. Amanda? Her grandmother asked as soon as she stepped into view. Your father. He? He's very ill. What happened? Amanda demanded. She felt cold inside. She had never seen her grandmother so emotional before. Her grandmother blinked, and she was clearly close to tears. I don't know. She stammered. We were walking, and suddenly he cried out and fell. And? Amanda felt cold inside. She took a deep breath and took her grandmother's hand. Grandmother, come up to the house. I'm sure it will be well. No. Her grandmother said and shook her head, suddenly agitated. I cannot go before I know your father has been helped. Please. Run for the physician. I cannot run fast enough. She started to cry, and Amanda realized how desperate she had been to help. Of course. She said. She turned and ran. Help. She called as she ran back up the steps to the house. Help. Someone, fetch the physician. She was doubled over, heaving in breath. When Mr. Lowry came over, frowning. Lady Amanda? What is it? Lord Foley. She said instantly. He fell. He was out walking. Please, someone, fetch the physician now. She took a deep breath. Chest aching with emotions. And please. Someone tell my sister. Of course, Lady Amanda. Mr. Lowry said. He rushed away and Amanda heard his hushed voice talking to a servant. She looked around, too afraid and shocked for tears. What has happened? A voice said from behind her back. She turned around and found Lord Sutcliffe. Lord Sutcliffe, my father fell. He was out walking. He seems badly wounded. She shut her eyes. She couldn't imagine it. She didn't want to. She felt so relieved that Lord Sutcliffe was here. Seeing him made her feel much calmer. Where is he? 
Lord Sutcliffe said at once. Let me go to help. Maybe I can carry him back. He's in the garden, a voice said from the door. It was Lady Foley, Amanda's grandmama. She was clinging to the doorpost, chest lifting with having run up the stairs. Her gaunt face was flushed and her forehead pulsed where a vein moved under the skin. Grandmother? Amanda asked, standing and running to her. Please. Sit down. Where is father? How did he get there? The gardener carried him. He's under the tree. Has someone fetched the physician? She asked. Her voice was faint. As Amanda watched, she gripped tighter onto the doorframe, and she reached out a hand. Afraid she would fall over. Grandmother, please. Go and sit down. Lord Sutcliffe? Please help her. She looked over her shoulder, her hand in her grandmother's. Grandmother held on as if she might fall. Where was Patricia? She would want to be here. And please. Someone needs to find my sister. Of course. My lady, please let me escort you upstairs. Lord Sutcliffe said, holding out his arm so that Lady Foley could place her hand in his elbow and lean on him. Amanda nodded to them and then ran into the garden. Outside, before she could think of going to the stables, she saw three gardeners. They were standing under the tree, looking down at the ground. Amanda felt her heart almost stop. She ran to her father and dropped to her knees beside him. Father, it's me. She whispered, and held his hands. He was lying on his back. His face looked strange, one side of his mouth drooping. She reached for his hand. It was so cold. Father. He looked at her, but he didn't seem to recognize her at first. He tried to say something, but his mouth didn't seem to move properly. Father. She whispered again. She clung to his hand. He was looking at her, and she thought he knew she was there. But he seemed unable to speak or move. We carried him here. He can't walk, my lady. One of the gardeners said. She looked up at him in shock. The physician will be here shortly. She said, and made herself stand. I am sure he will be able to help Lord Foley. In the meanwhile, I think we should move him elsewhere. Take him inside, eh? The man who stood next to her asked. You're right, my lady. We'll move him in immediately. Amanda nodded. She couldn't say anything. She didn't watch as they lifted her father to his feet. Seeing him like this was too horrid. Please. Can someone go to the stables to find out if my sister has come back from her ride? She said in a small voice. Yes, of course, my lady. One of the men said, and headed off almost as soon as he'd spoken. The other two bent down and lifted him up. He grunted as one man lifted him under the arms, another under the knees. Feeling helpless, and hating to see her father in such pain, Amanda walked slowly to the house behind them. She was not going to think about anything. All she was going to think about, she decided, was what needed to be done. The physician must be taken to him. Someone needs to check on grandmother. Patricia must be informed. She walked to the door of the drawing room, and almost walked into the physician, who was just coming up the stairs. Where is Lord Foley? He asked. He's been moved to his bedchamber. She said. He is conscious, but unable to move. I will attend to him at once, my lady. Amanda nodded to him. She paused in the hallway. She felt empty. She was desperate to talk to somebody and headed to the parlor, where her grandmother often sat. She was relieved when she found her there. Grandmother, the physician is here. Father is in bed. My poor son. She murmured, as if she hadn't heard Amanda speaking. My poor boy. He's such a good man. Why should this happen? She ran a hand down her face. 
The stern, dignified countenance looked suddenly so old. Sometimes bad things happen, grandmother. Amanda said. She took her grandmother's hand in hers, the long bony fingers curling around her own. She could feel how distressed her grandmother was. And she was terribly distressed, too. She didn't want to think about it. Father is not too unwell. He will not. This will not do him harm. She couldn't bear to think about the other possibility. That this might take him from her. Her heart was screaming it, but she paid no heed. I will go and find out what's happening. She promised her grandmother. She also needed to find someone to fetch Patricia and tell her what was happening too. Where did Lord Sutcliffe go? She asked her grandmother. He's still downstairs somewhere. Her grandmother said, flapping her hand in the direction of the stairs. My poor son. My poor boy. Amanda nodded. She poured her grandmother more tea, but decided it was best to leave her be. She was in shock, and somebody plying her with questions was not helpful. She tiptoed out and headed down the stairs to find Lord Sutcliffe. She found him in the hallway by the front door, pacing. He looked up as she entered. How is he? he asked. I don't know. Amanda whispered. She reached for him and to her surprise he took her hands in his. My lady. He said. I am so sorry for you. I wish I could do more. I am sure Lord Foley will recover. Until such time, I am absolutely ready to assist you. His blue eyes were gentle. I appreciate it. She said softly. She meant it. She looked up into his face, and she wished that she could feel something besides emptiness. He looked back at her. If there is anything I can do. He began. My lord, I think it best if you go. She said softly. There is nothing you can help with. He nodded. Then I will go. I am only an hour's ride away, should you need me, my lady. She smiled. I know. She said. He smiled back, and she knew he was remembering their meeting. She looked away as he walked out through the front door and down the steps. As soon as he had gone, she went quickly up the hallway to her father. She found her grandmother waiting outside the door. She looked up nervously as Amanda came to join her. Where is your sister? Grandmother asked. Amanda frowned. She had been about to ask the same question. Just as she tried to think of something to say, she heard footsteps on the stairs. Grandmother. Amanda. I just heard. Where is father? She was panting, cheeks flushed, her hair coming down from its bun. She ran to their grandmother, who took her hand. My child. I wish I didn't have to tell you this. Your father is gravely ill. No. Patricia said at once. No. He can't be. It's not fair. He can't do this. He can't leave us. Amanda shut her eyes. She could hear the fear in her younger sister's voice, and she reached out a hand to take hers. Shh. She said gently. He's alive. The physician is here. He will do what he can. We must wait for him to finish with Papa. No. Patricia said, quite loudly. No. I want to see him now. Where is Papa? Amanda thought she might walk into the room, and took a deep breath. Unsure of what to do. She felt relieved when the physician came out through the door. He looked grave. How is he? She asked. My lady, it is apoplexy. I am afraid there is little I can do. I have treated him with volatile salts, and he is awake. I am afraid his speech is impaired. But he is awake. He can move? She asked, feeling joy lift her. He is awake, and he has some movement. He cannot move his left hand or left leg. 
But he's alive. Amanda insisted. She found the man's downcast mood annoying. What mattered it, if her father needed to walk with crutches, or if he couldn't speak? If he was alive, if he was here. That was surely all that mattered, if anything. Yes, my lady. He is. The physician admitted. He looked down at the ground. I have left what little maid a come on I can provide. Amanda glanced at Patricia, who had let out a breath. She looked relieved too. Grandmother shut her eyes, leaning against the wall. Amanda took her hand, afraid that she might fall. Patricia was holding her right arm and together they supported her. You will see him again tomorrow? To see if he needs aught else? She demanded as the physician turned to leave. She felt her sorrow stab into her, mixed with a desperate anger. How could he just go away, as if there was no hope? She wanted to shake him. To make him stay. My lady, I will. He promised. She was still standing at the end of the stairs when he walked away. She felt nothing as she and Patricia walked with their grandmother to the drawing room. She would have expected to feel sorrow, remorse, pain. But instead, there was only this awful absence. This hollow inside her where feelings should have been. And all that was there was an empty screaming. As she walked back to the drawing room, she looked out of the window at the garden. She recalled the earlier moments of the day and felt sure that. Whatever plans Lady Sutcliffe might have made with him. Her father would be pleased to see her so happy. She couldn't wait to tell him when he was well enough to hear. Chapter 6 Amanda left the drawing room after what felt like hours. Her grandmother had gone long ago, and she presumed was in her own rooms, resting. Patricia was on the chaise lounge by the window, staring out at the garden. Neither of them needed her, so she headed back up the steps. Feeling helpless. To check on her father. He's resting now, my lady. His manservant said as she tiptoed through the door. Good. She said. She glanced down at the bed. Her father looked to be asleep, his eyes shut. Face pale and still. The manservant had clearly been mopping his brow with cold water. For it was still damp and shining. The man was seated on a chair by the bed, and clearly intended to watch over him all night. If anything happens during the night, please call me. She told him. He nodded. My lady, I shall. She took one last look at him and tiptoed down the hallway. Maybe the cook can send me up a tray of broth. I have no stomach for dinner. She tiptoed back to the drawing room. Patricia was still in there. She was still sitting on the chaise lounge, curled up with her back to Amanda. Sister? Amanda said softly. Would you like some dinner? Patricia didn't look up. No. She said. Go away. Amanda shut her eyes. She felt desperately sorry for her sister. She knew Patricia could be difficult, but she could feel real compassion for her now. After all, she had known their father for so much longer than herself. And he was her only parent. Patricia, please. Amanda said gently. You have to eat something. You need to stay strong. Patricia said nothing. She turned around as Amanda walked back to the doorway, and Amanda could see that she'd been crying heavily. Father could die. Patricia said stonily, and I don't care about anything anymore. What does it matter if I starve to death, if father isn't here? She turned away and looked out of the window, shoulders hunched over. Amanda felt her own heart wrench. He is just as likely to live. She tried to reassure her sister, though she wasn't sure about that herself. And he wouldn't want you to starve. He loves you. I don't care. I don't want him to die. Why does he want to go away and leave us alone? Patricia burst out. It's so unfair. Amanda looked away. She didn't know what to say. Patricia was younger than her by three years. But in some ways she seemed a child still. 
she could understand her pain, though. She was very close to their father, almost too dependent on his praise, in Amanda's mind. She had always considered that Lord Foley could have helped Patricia to outgrow her dependence on him and on his good opinion. Instead, he had kept her perpetually by his side, so that she had no friends besides him, and cared for nothing save his praise. If she was finding this so difficult now, it was his fault too. And Amanda wished she could tell him. Patricia, are you sure there is nothing I can do? She asked softly. No. I just want you to leave me alone. I will go upstairs, then. Amanda said softly. If you want to speak with me, I'll be in my bedroom. She tiptoed quietly away. She went up to her room and, when Maddie knocked at the door, she sent her away with a request for some broth and bread rolls. When she sat down at her dressing table, she was shocked to see her own reflection. Her face was pinched with worry, her eyes red-rimmed. Father! Please get better! She whispered it into the silence. She felt her own tears well up. She couldn't bear to lose him. He had become so important to her. A wise, comfortable presence in a hostile world. She could understand Patricia's pain, though she herself felt it in another way. She heard a tap on the door and Maddie came in, bearing a tray with a bowl of soup and some bread. She put it down wordlessly, on the table in the corner. Thank you, Maddie. Amanda nodded to her. She immediately started to eat, but she felt no real appetite. She managed to finish the tray of food after what felt like ages. She was setting aside the bowl just as she heard a knock on the door. My lady, the Baroness was asking for you. A maid said. Grandmother? Amanda felt worried suddenly. I'll come straight away. Where is she? She's in the parlor. She added, curtsying and going to the window to draw the curtains shut. Amanda nodded her thanks and hurried quietly from the room. She ran lightly down the hallway to the parlor. The curtains were drawn and the fire blazed, casting unforgiving light on grandmother's stern face. Amanda! Her grandmother said as she dropped to a chair beside her, taking her hand in her own. I had to send for you at once. We must talk. Yes, grandmother, what is it? Amanda asked, her own heart thudding. She looked into her grandmother's thin, watchful face, and wondered what it was that disturbed her so. Your father is awake. Her grandmother said. We spoke to each other. You did? Amanda stared at her. He can speak? She felt a wash of joy through her body. She had seen him sleeping, and she had thought that he was still unconscious. He could speak, but it is very difficult for him. He was hard to interpret. Her grandmother explained. Her brow was creased with a frown. I see. Amanda said. But, he is better. He is conscious again. She added, her joy instantly returning. Yes, he is her grandmother said, and Amanda wondered why she was looking so concerned. But I needed to send for you at once. This is a matter of great urgency. What is? Amanda said, feeling fearful. Your father and I spoke of his last wishes. No, don't look at me like that. It's needed. He said that you must wed. Wed? Amanda stared at her fearfully. Grandmother, I can't just do that. Not just like that. Her grandmother shut her eyes wearily. I am aware of that. She said slowly. And that is why I am going to take us to London. You need to wed soon, my child. If you don't, this estate will pass to Cousin Walter. And I have very strong reasons to hope that it will never happen. Amanda stared at her. Grandmother. Please. She felt as if her world had been turned upside down. Her father was ill. 
so ill that he was speaking of his own impending death. And now her grandmother was thrusting another change upon her? You need to take this matter earnestly. Your father's cousin is no baron. He's a wastrel and he'd ruin everything my own dear husband built. I will not see him in this house. You must wed soon, my child. No. Amanda put her hand to her mouth. No, I won't. He won't die. I won't let him. She said stubbornly. She leaned back in the chair as her grandmother raised her hand. Rings sparkled on her fingers, the light of the fire dancing off rubies. My child, regardless of whether he will pass away or not, he needs peace of mind. We must give it to him. You must wed and soon. She sounded tired. Grandmother. Amanda cleared her throat. She was about to mention her talk with Lord Sutcliffe and how he had wanted to ask for permission to court her. He hadn't been able to ask anyone. But he had told her. Lord Sutcliffe. I have sent word to Lady Sutcliffe. Her grandmother continued. I did not approve of the affection between you. And you did make it too obvious to all. Besides, now that your father is sick, you owe it to him to save this estate. And he's afraid for the state it's in. No, my dear. It needs to be a truly grand match. One that will bring an immense fortune to the family. So that your father need not worry about the state of our coffers. I know you can do it. Amanda looked down at the parquet floor. She felt helpless. What could she say? Grandmother, please don't make me do this. She begged. She understood that her father was frightened about his own death. But how could her grandmother expect her to give up the one thing that meant anything to her? When she looked up, her grandmother was looking at her, a neutral expression on her face. My girl, you are a baron's daughter. It is up to you to do your duty. Besides, you're a beautiful young girl, my dear. She smiled fondly. If we go to London, you could attract the eye of any man there. No, a grand match is what I want. Something truly profitable. And I am determined to make it happen. I have written to friends of mine, Lady Lagrange and Lady Endstone. Together they have access to the best circles in London, and we will make sure you meet the best sorts of people, so this can happen. Amanda stared at her, and she thought her grandmother looked quite cheered by the prospect. Her grey eyes had brightened and some of the tension had gone from her face. She welcomes this as a challenge. It's something she can do to help her son. She swallowed hard. Grandmother. If I go to London? She whispered. What will happen to father? I will not go for the whole season. We cannot leave him. And, if I find no husband this season, I beg you, let me choose my own. It was the last chance she had against her grandmother. The last way she could try to sway her to her side. And, if she really did her best to repel all prospective husbands, she could return here and do as she wished. Her grandmother rested her hands over her face for a moment, rubbing her temples firmly. When she let her hands sink, her eyes were cold. You drive a bargain like a fishmonger. She said flatly. But yes. If you insist, then we will settle for one season. I do not like to be too long away from the house. Amanda felt her heart lift. She had won a minor victory. Her grandmother might bundle her off to London, but she could at least allow her to follow her own plan if they failed. Thank you, Grandmama she said softly. Her grandmother looked at her, and there was resentment and disapproval in her look, as well as humor. You have won one round, her grandmother said. She sounded almost admiring. Amanda, puzzled, turned around and walked out of the room. I am going to check on father now, she said as she left. I will not disturb him. Her grandmother inclined her head a stiff nod, and Amanda hurried away. She knew she was going to cry, and she didn't want anyone to see. 
not her father, or Patricia, and certainly not her grandmother. She sniffed and looked up at the ceiling, taking a deep breath. Father, please don't die. She whispered to the shadows in the hallway. I can't bear to lose you. She took another deep breath, trying to compose herself. Then she headed down the hallway to her father's bedroom. His manservant came out as she paused at the door. He was carrying some linen, and his face was grave. How is my father, Mr. Haverley? She asked. The man looked down, as if he didn't want to alarm her. He's resting, my lady. Best not disturb him. Amanda swallowed hard. Yes. You're right. She headed up to her room swiftly, feeling her tears about to spill over. She couldn't bear this. She couldn't lose the one parent she had left in the world, and face her grandmother's cruel decisions. She couldn't do it. Mama? She whispered to the dark, the candle flickering on the dressing table. Please. If you can hear me, please don't let father die. I cannot lose you both. She stared into the darkness. The fire flickered in the grate, making shadows shift about the room. She fancied she saw movement in the corner, almost as if a woman in a gown had stirred there. It was just the briefest suggestion of a person, but it gave her heart. Mama watches over me. She will take care of me. She had always believed that. Her mother had never deserted her in life, and she felt strongly that, though she might be in another realm. She still watched over her now. She took a deep breath. I need to do something. Her thoughts were more settled now, and the one thing she could do was clear to her. She could write to Lord Sutcliffe and tell him what had happened. It was all she could do to better the situation. She sat down at her desk and hoped she could get the letter to him fast. Chapter 7 Henry frowned as somebody hammered urgently on his door. He was in bed, and he threw his night robe around his shoulders and went to answer the door. What is it? He asked his manservant frowningly. It's a letter. It's urgent, my lord. Mr. Redfield said quickly. I'm sorry for disturbing you, but the bearer of the letter is waiting for a reply. Who sent it? He asked, accepting the parchment hastily. There was no seal on it and no indicator of where it came from. He drew a deep breath. He unfolded it and looked inside. It was ten o'clock at night. Who had sent it? As he read, he felt urgency descend on him. He recognized the writing, at once, and the tone of the letter. He felt an ache of sadness. Poor Amanda. She was clearly in a terrible situation. I fear my grandmother will not allow a match between us. She seeks to wed me to someone of her own choice. I do not know if we will be able to see each other more. I must ask for your tolerant understanding. He sat down at his desk, opening it to find a sheet of paper and pen. He dipped the quill in ink, desperate to send off a reply as soon as possible. Please. He said over his shoulder, trying to focus on what he was writing at the same time. Take this downstairs and give it to whosoever brought this letter at once. Yes, my lord. His manservant said. He stepped back to wait in the doorway frowning in a way that made Henry hurry to finish. My dear Amanda, he wrote. I will do my best to assist you. I cannot allow you to be subjected to this travesty. I will speak with your grandmother at the soonest moment. I will not let her do this. He hastily signed the letter, his mind reeling. What else could he do? He looked at the clock. It was past ten, and he was sure that, were he to ride there now, he would not be able to speak with the Dowager Baroness. He was sure she would be asleep by now. He would have to go first thing in the morning, as soon as she was likely to admit guests. Please, he said, swiftly, take this to the courier. He folded the letter in half, without sealing it. There was no time. 
he trusted his manservant to take it down and see to it that it was delivered. Once the man left, he shrugged off his night robe and paced the room. Unable to get into bed. He knew he would not be able to sleep. He stared into the grate, waiting for his manservant to return. Please, I cannot let her be taken from me. He didn't know to whom he addressed the entreaty. All he knew was that he felt strongly about this in a way he had never felt strongly about anything before. He could not let Amanda be taken from him. My lord? Mr. Redfield called. It's sent off. Thank you. Henry said. He looked back at the bed, wondering if he would be able to sleep now. That's all, you may go. He added, as his manservant bowed and left. He slipped into bed and pulled the coverlet up to his chin. He felt freezing cold, though he knew it was not particularly cold in the room. He thought he would never sleep. So he was surprised when he woke to feel warmth on his face and find his manservant had been in and tidied the room. The curtains were open, and the gazette was on the chair by the door. Henry sighed and pulled the bell to summon the man to help him dress. When he reached the breakfast room, he was surprised to see his mother alone at the table. Mother? He frowned, drawing out his chair and sitting down. Where is father? He was usually the first at breakfast. It felt strange that he wasn't at the table. It was only eight o'clock, and he would normally still be here. Reading the Gazette and finishing his meal. His mother raised a brow. He had to go to London urgently. It's some matter of business. Investments or something. She shook her head, reaching for the teapot. She seemed completely unruffled. What? Henry stared at her. Sorry, mother. When did he have to leave? He was having trouble making sense of that. Oh. He left just before midnight. He said it was urgent. He needs to be there for some sort of meeting the day after tomorrow. Said he needed to get a head start. She sipped her tea, regarding him with a calm face. Henry felt one of his hands run down his face, a habit when he was tense and worried. Things were happening so fast. He had intended to speak with his father and tell him of his plan to court Amanda. When will he be back? Henry asked, frowning. Oh. Next week, I should think. But I have another matter to discuss with you. The season starts next week, so I think we will be in London before your father returns. You can speak with him there. What? This time, Henry pushed his chair back and stood up. Mother? Please. This is madness. Why should I wish to go to the season? I already know whom I wish to wed. His mother looked at him. Her blue eyes, so pale and slightly prominent, were cold. You know how I feel about that. No, I don't. Henry exploded. Mother, but you are so vague about things. If you have this burning desire for me to wed Patricia and not Amanda, I do wish you could explain this. His mother snapped at him. You're no fool, Henry. I ought not to have to explain. Henry took a breath and tried, without success, to rein in his anger. He was tired. He was worried. He was desperate to check on Amanda, and he hadn't had a chance to. He absolutely did not need his mother to speak so cryptically to him. He shut his eyes. Mother? I understand that you have some reason for preferring Patricia over Amanda. But I do not personally understand it. She is personable, accomplished, kind and gentle. She's a servant's child, Henry. His mother snapped. She's a disgrace. The whole of society would laugh at us. Henry stared. He had been angry before, he thought. But it was nothing compared to the white-hot incandescence that flooded him now. He took a step back for fear of what he might do. Mother? You will never speak thus of Lady Amanda again. His voice thrummed with his rage. His mother looked afraid for a moment. 
she put her hands on the table as if she was going to stand up and walk out. Then she cleared her throat. Son, whether I say it or not, it's the truth. You're a fool to tangle with the entire family, as it happens and I have changed my mind on that. Why do you think I want you to go to London? She asked, putting her head on one side as if she addressed a recalcitrant schoolboy. Henry looked at her. I'm not going. He said. What else could he say? He was sure he had made his anger clear by now. This time, his mother pushed back her chair. She glared at him frostily. And he saw in her eyes the exact image of her own father, Major Crofter. Cold, hard eyes, utterly without pity just like her father's in the gallery painting. You will go. She whispered, or I swear I will see you disowned. Henry felt his jaw drop. He didn't know what to say. He had so many surprises in the last days, and this was one that was so utterly unexpected that it made no sense. You really wish to threaten me? He said after what felt like a minute of utter shock. I don't threaten. I will do it. She said softly. They looked at each other. He stared into those sky-pale eyes and felt as if they were standing off in a sword fight. His mother had a will of iron, and he was beginning to realize he did, too. Between them, there was no easy victory. You can do that, if you wish. He said softly. I invite you to do it, in fact. Disown me. You can leave the estate to cousin Alexander. I am more than happy to let him have it. His mind raced. He had an allowance of three thousand pounds a year. It wasn't a fortune, but he could live extremely well on it. He could walk away and let them leave the estate to his cousin. He hadn't been raised as an heir, and he wouldn't know what to do at all. But if his mother made that choice, she should be content with it. His mother didn't stop staring at him. He thought a pulse jumped in her vein by the temple and he waited for her to take a turn at striking at him. Fine. She said after a long moment. Watford can have it. But you mustn't think you'll be getting an allowance, because you won't be. If you walk away from this estate, you do so with the shirt on your back. Henry felt as if she'd struck him. This was worse than a threat. He took a deep breath. You know father wouldn't agree to any of this he said softly. Well, you might think that. But he already has. Henry stared. If someone had come in at that moment and told him he was actually found on the doorstep of Sutcliffe House, and his father was a monarch from Cathay, he would have been less shocked. He gulped. My father would never betray me like that, would he? He couldn't have been more overwhelmed. His father's decision struck him like a blow and when he looked into his mother's eyes, he saw only her granite hard determination. I'll go to London. Henry said at length, making hasty plans. In London, he could join the military. His own savings would buy a commission in the army, and he could seek his fortune. If his mother wouldn't let him marry Amanda and keep the family wealth, he would prove to her he'd make his own but not for the season. I'll go there and I won't come back. His mother stared at him. You wouldn't. She said. Henry nodded coldly. Nobody threatened him. If his inheritance was a bauble she thought she could use to cajole and tease him. He wanted nothing to do with it. He would rather leave it all and make his own wealth. I will. I am going to pack right away. Henry, you will come back this instant. She shouted. But he had already turned away and walked out of the room. In his bedchamber, he shut the door and sat down heavily on the bed. He couldn't quite believe what he'd done. He shut his eyes and tried to think carefully. I am mad, doing this. He knew it was madness, and yet it felt absolutely right. He stood and pulled the bell. Yes, my lord. His manservant, Mr. Redfield, said. Pack my bag, please, Redfield. 
We are going to London. The only thing that he cared about at that moment was getting word to Amanda so that she would know he had left, and she would understand. Chapter 8 Amanda looked out of the window of the coach. Her heart was as empty as the foggy landscape. She could feel nothing. Next to her, Grandmother and Patricia both slept. She was, to all intents and purpose, alone. She looked out of the window and felt her own thoughts return more keenly now that she had time to think. I want to run away. They were on the road to London. She looked down the road, too full of emotions and sadness to cry. If she stopped to think about it, she would go crazy. It was too hard to leave her father behind. And Lord Sutcliffe. Her fingers went to her purse. His letter was in there. His precious letter where he promised to write. Where he assured her that he was going to London outside his wishes. She could feel the hard parchment. She wanted to read it, but the crinkle of paper might wake her grandmother. And she relished the time alone. They had been on the road for a day. And she had so little time to herself. She was not about to wake anybody up and disturb her peace again. Amanda watched the road again. She felt the rattle of the coach as they went down the dirt roadway that led to the London road. They would travel all day. And then tomorrow in the afternoon. They should arrive. And then I will be too many miles away from father. She couldn't bear the thought that he was all those miles away and ailing. She had said her farewells and not been entirely sure what he'd said in reply. She believed he knew she was going away. And that she'd be gone for three or four weeks at least. But she wasn't sure if he knew. Because she couldn't understand his replies. She shut her eyes, lost in the memory of that lined, ravaged face. Her father had lost so much weight in the few days since his fit. He found it so hard to eat but she knew he hated Mr. Haley having to feed him. He was already looking gaunt and haggard, his eyes sunk in his countenance. She heard the sound of the coach slowing and opened her eyes again. They were turning left onto another road. She shut her eyes again and leaned back against the cushion behind her, feeling weary. Around her, her grandmother and sister slept. When she woke again, it was to discover they had stopped for lunch at an inn. Her grandmother was awake and alighted briskly from the coach. Patricia followed her, sullen and still. Amanda got out, wincing as her ankles ached with the impact. Longford Inn, Lady Foley. The coachman announced. Lady Foley sniffed. Well, it'll do. She said lightly, raising a knight to consider the building briefly. Girls, come on. Let's go in and we'll sit in the parlour, mind you. She said to the coachman, who would make the arrangements. I'll not escort two ladies to the common dining room. Yes, my lady. Amanda felt too sick to eat. Patricia was talking almost constantly, and she thought her sister was also nervous and tense. Their grandmother sat stiffly and ate and Amanda could see she was just annoyed by her sister's chatter. She wished she could do something but her heart felt empty. She was relieved when they set off on their way again. The next day, at around one o'clock in the afternoon, they reached London. Amanda had been asleep, but, as they rolled over a particularly heavy bump in the road, her eyes opened suddenly. She heard a clock chime the hour and looked around, feeling almost fearful. Where are we? She murmured. She could see buildings. All manner of them. Tiled and thatched, whitewashed and sandstone. Tall and low-roofed. They were crowded together on either side of a narrow street and her heart thudded alarmingly. My dear child. Her grandmother said. Why, this is London. Amanda stared. She was here. She looked out of the window. Patricia was awake and she was talking excitedly again. Amanda stayed where she was, eyes glued to the scene as they rolled down the street into the city. The first thing that struck her was the number of folks on the street. 
She stared at a market square avidly, and thought she could count a hundred people. Some of the people were well-dressed. Gentlemen in top hats and ladies in big, decorated bonnets. Some of them were dressed in ordinary coats and dresses. Some were in rags. She shrank back against the pane and stared. People were haggling at stalls, promenading along the street. Begging and bargaining and shouting and calling and laughing. It all struck her as chaos. Noise, movement and sound. The place seemed to have a teeming, restless life to it. Like the driving power of a ship sailing with the wind. It's so big, and loud, and crowded. She looked at it with a mix of wonder and horror. It alarmed and amazed her almost equally, and she thought that. Now she had seen it. Nothing would ever seem the same to her. Here we are. Her grandmother sniffed. I do hope I brought a handkerchief with lavender oil. He smell can be awful. City air. She sniffed theatrically. Amanda stared at her. She couldn't believe that her grandmother could reduce even London to something mundane. She turned away and watched as the coach rolled up the street and into town. As they progressed through the city, the surroundings changed. They had been lined with a mix of different buildings. Some stone and some wattle, all ages and shapes and sizes. Now, they gave way to elegant stone constructions. Soaring and gracious. Ah! Her grandmother said, leaning back. We'll be arriving at Covent Garden any moment now. A little longer and we will reach the house. Oh, good. Amanda glanced at Patricia. She looked happy, and Amanda recalled that. While this was her first time in London, it was certainly not her sister's first. She leaned back and watched the buildings going by, and, for the first time in days, felt a flicker of excitement. There is so much to see here. She found herself waiting with excitement for the coach to stop. After what seemed like an age. Lengthened. She knew. By her impatience. The coach slowed and stopped. Ask. Right, then, girls. Out we get. Her grandmother said. Amanda stared as the coachman opened the door, and she felt a moment's fear as her turn came to jump down. It seemed to her that, once she had set foot here, something about her would alter. I will be one step closer to being Lady Amanda. It felt odd as she jumped down. Her feet, in firm-soled boots, clicked on the stone-lined pavement. She was here. She heard Patricia's delighted cry and saw her heading toward the steps of the building before them. Her grandmother was also walking surprisingly fast. But she herself lingered at the back. Craning her neck up. The building was tall. She guessed three floors. It was narrow, and built of sandstone or at least fronted with it. The color was almost peach in the afternoon light. The roof was gabled, the windows elegant and abundant. And a flight of steps led up to the imposing front door. Amanda lifted her skirt in her hand and reluctantly followed her family up the steps. Ah, Mr. Penning. We are here. I trust all is in readiness for us by now. Amanda looked up at the butler who had opened the door, and glanced at her grandmother, who was giving him her best cool stare. She was surprised to find that there were already people working in the house, and she realized with some surprise that the staff must be permanently employed here. How could her father afford to keep a furnished house, with staff, all these hundreds of miles away? It was still shocking her when her grandmother turned and frowned at her and she realized she was rooted to the spot. Coming, grandmother. She said, and, lifting her skirt out of the way, she stepped over the threshold and into the house. The first thing that struck her about the place was that it was quite new. The entrance was tiled, the roof painted white and molded. Soaring overhead. Come on, don't loiter about. Her grandmother called back to her as she climbed the staircase. We should refresh ourselves, take tea, and then set out for a walk about town. 
We need to make arrangements for the day. Are we to go out tonight? Patricia asked. She sounded excited. Which surprised Amanda. She just felt slightly ill at the prospect herself. It seemed impossible not to be tired after three days coach travel. We should indeed. Her grandmother called back, and Amanda thought that, suddenly, she could see how she had looked when she was young. There was a lively vitality in her face, and Amanda could see her as beautiful. She was clearly happy to be in London again. Patricia sounded delighted at the prospect, and Amanda shut her eyes and hoped her head would feel better soon. My lady. A maid said as she stepped into the room assigned to her. May I fetch you something? Hello. Amanda said shyly. She felt really uncomfortable having to meet a new maid. She wished Maddie could have come with them. But her grandmother had insisted on taking only one coach. I'm Lady Amanda. Who are you? Joanna. She said and dropped a curtsy. I'm pleased to help you, my lady. She smiled shyly, eyes fixed on the mat. Amanda nodded to her. I would like to rest for a while. Could you please call me if my grandmother has need of me? Of course, my lady. Amanda smiled reassuringly at her. Joanna was much younger than her and looked nervous. Amanda wondered how long the maid had worked here, and if she'd had to be hired on the spot to staff the house for their arrival. When she was alone, Amanda rinsed her face and hands and sat down heavily on the bed. She lay back on the pillows and was soon asleep. My lady. She heard someone call, bringing her attention back to the moment. My lady. Lady Foley summoned you. Oh. Amanda jumped up. She was still wearing her traveling cloak and boots. She looked around desperately. I'll be there directly. She said. Is she in the drawing room? Yes. It's on the right as you face the stairs, on the same floor as your room. Amanda threw down her cloak, changed her boots and hastily tried to pin back her unruly hair. Then she ran in the direction indicated, looking for the drawing room. Ask Amanda. Her grandmother greeted. She was sitting at a table with Patricia, a tray of tea things on the table in front of them. You slept, I believe? She asked. She looked refreshed, her dark grey hair in an elegant upswept style. Dark against the backdrop of green wallpaper. Yes. Amanda looked at the teapot, awkwardly. She could see that her grandmother and Patricia had both changed into day dresses, and someone had arranged both their hair. She felt shy and tucked dark hair behind her ears. Self-consciously. No matter. We'll leave in an hour's time. I have a mind to visit that new tea house. Her grandmother said lightly. And I need to meet with Lady Lagrange. She agreed to get me passes. To Almax. Patricia squealed. Amanda just looked at them both as if they were speaking French or any other language she didn't understand. Lady Foley smiled. Almux is the venue to be seen. She said lightly. It's where all debutantes go to make their connections. Now, I know you're not as young as the girls who have their first season, but that doesn't matter. You'll look charming in that new gown. She favored Amanda with a rare thin-lipped smile. Amanda felt nervous. I also have a new gown. Patricia said almost defensively. Papa bought it for me. It's pink. Yes, you do, and you look charming too, my child. Her grandmother said with a hint of temper. Now, hurry up. We'll take tea and then get ready to go. And the sooner we refresh ourselves, the sooner we can go into town. Amanda drank her tea, but she was nervous and it made her feel sick. She could smell the sweet pastries laid out for their refreshment. But she felt far too ill to eat anything. She was feeling afraid about the ball and all the expectations on her. How can grandmother do this to me? 
She has barely finished teaching me the acceptable dances. She stole a look at her grandmother, but she was sipping tea from a delicate cup and seemed totally oblivious to everybody. Amanda was glad when they finally left the room. She almost ran to her bedchamber, then shut the door behind her and started hastily taking off her stained traveling gown. My lady. Joanna said, aghast. Here. Let me help you. Thank you, Joanna. The green day dress, if you please. She felt much better when, thirty minutes later, she was dressed and ready to go to town, bonnet and parasol ready for the walk through the streets. The green dress was made of a soft muslin. And with it she wore white gloves and a tight-fitting white coat that came down to her knees. Her bonnet was white with ribbons in pale green. And the wide brim shaded her face. Rendering the lacy parasol redundant. Their grandmother had donned a bonnet, too. A dark red one with ribbons in a dark brown. The color of the bonnet matching her dress and the ribbons matching her cloak. She looked very elegant, Amanda thought. She took her hand almost nervously and they walked down the street together. The tea house struck Amanda as horribly noisy. She looked over her grandmother's shoulder into the vast, bright lit room, shrinking back from the sound of people talking quite loudly. She could see gentlemen in dark suits, and ladies in dresses as dark as was fashionable. Women of her age normally wore pale colors. But these ladies were dressed quite daringly in red and blue of dark tones. They were sitting at tables together. And the speech and laughter were fast and merry. She heard her grandmother sniff audibly. A poet's gathering. She said. Amanda wanted to laugh. Surely that was a good thing? Weren't poets supposed to be fashionable? But her grandmother was standing in the doorway stiffly as if everyone within harbored some terrible contagion. Grandmother. Come, let's go in. Patricia insisted. Amanda found herself agreeing with her for once. She was about to add her voice to Patricia's when the proprietor came over and called out to them. Good afternoon, my lady. A table for three? Well, yes. Her grandmother sniffed. If you please. Amanda followed her grandmother inside. She was, for once, pleased to have her with them. She felt people staring and the looks on some of the faces made her feel afraid. She'd never seen gentlemen stare openly before. May I take your coat? A man asked her. She jumped, but it was the proprietor. She nodded and hastily shrugged out of bonnet and coat. Feeling desperately awkward. She looked at her grandmother, but she was completely calm. Her back straight. She walked over to the table and kept her gaze distant and serene. As if the whole vast room was empty. Or the people so many fence posts on an open moor. Amanda tried to copy her and drew out her chair. Pretending the rest of the room was empty. Now, we should meet Lady Lagrange here soon. Her grandmother said. I wrote to inform her we would arrive around midday. And Mr. Penning took her my card as soon as we arrived. She should arrive any minute. And I will be sure to ask her to introduce us to important figures in society. You know I want you to make a fine match, my dear. Amanda could barely hear her. She could see Patricia staring at their grandmother in surprise. But her attention soon wandered. The rest of the room was too distracting. She looked around, gazing in wonder at everything. She could see ladies and gentlemen talking and laughing. And she thought that they seemed quite relaxed in their demeanor. Far more so than anything her grandmother allowed in her. She saw someone rest their elbow on the table. And one of the men ruffled a woman's hair fondly. She was staring, and she heard her grandmother whisper in her ear. These people are not reputable. Especially not some of the poets themselves. She made a harsh noise in the back of her throat. I wouldn't stare too much. And don't even think of emulating their behavior. It's most disrespectable. Amanda frowned. She was confused. Weren't poets celebrated by their society? 
She certainly knew that poetry salons and recitals were extremely fashionable. And many women clamored to get to know writers and poets. So why was her grandmother so shocked by them? She looked up as her grandmother ordered tea and cakes. And then she heard her give a little gasp as a woman of about her age came over to the table. Lady Lagrange, you're here. These are my granddaughters. Lady Amanda, and Lady Patricia. Girls, this is Lady Lagrange. Now, do join us, my dear. We've just ordered tea and gatto. I ordered some for you, too. Amanda listened with half an ear as they talked. At the end of the discussion, which seemed interminable, and throughout which she tried to drink tea and eat some of the delicious-looking cake, they stood to leave. Now, we have what we need, my dears. Her grandmother said as they walked back down the road toward their lodgings again. She patted her purse, hanging from the wrist of her left hand. These are our passes to the most important venue in London. Amanda nodded, and was surprised to feel excitement mixed in with her fear. She couldn't help the fact that she was at least a little curious. She had only been to two balls in her life before, and those had been fairly small scale. Held at Lady Epstone's in the country. She had no idea what a ball might be like in London. And tonight she was going to find out. She couldn't help feeling a tingle of anticipation about it. Chapter 9 Henry looked at the window as his manservant drew the drapes across it, shutting out the dark. He was exhausted, and he really wanted to get into bed and sleep. Perhaps for ten or twelve hours. Unfortunately, it would be another six hours at least before he could sleep. And he was not pleased. Redfield, can you fix my cravat? If you please? And then I can go and get this confounded evening started. He didn't want to go out. But he knew that he had to. He looked around the thread barums he'd rented. And knew that the sooner he could do something to change his state, the better. He had agreed to meet Anselm, a colleague from his time at Cambridge. He needed to speak with him, and the silly fellow had insisted on meeting at Almack's assembly rooms. His manservant just nodded. He came over and started to tie the elaborate necktie, making several layers of silk around Henry's neck. He looked down at it and tried to feel dignified. It's a bit difficult, when I feel like I've got a bow around my neck like a prized bottle of wine. Am I acceptable? He asked his man who put his head on one side, eyeing him skeptically. Yes. He said, my lord. Henry grinned. The man had a subtle sense of humor, he could allow him that. At least Henry tended to find himself laughing in his company. He headed down the stairs and climbed into the carriage. It feels like I've only been out of the thing five minutes. He looked out of the window did his best to ignore his aching back, and tried to conjure some sort of excitement for the upcoming event. It was difficult, since he knew it would be quite awful. There would be too many people in a crowded space, with too much bright light and loud noise for his sore head, and he would spend the night having to be friendly to people he barely knew. They drew up outside Almax, and he felt the coach slow to a halt. He shut his eyes, trying to conjure up some energy when he felt half dead inside. He hated having to be here, he was restless and angry. And he knew it was for one thing only. He missed Amanda horridly. Here we are. The coachman called down. Henry clambered down wearily and nodded to him. Come back at midnight, please. He told him, and heard him call out to farewell as he turned the coach in the road and headed away. Henry turned and walked up the steps. He looked up at Almux and felt an ache in his chest. The last time he was here had been when he was eight and twenty years old. He had come with his family. And being here again made him feel their absence. He went in through the doors, resolutely, and down into the room. He could feel people staring at him and he looked away. He hated it. Lord Sutcliffe. A footman announced. 
He could see heads turning idly toward them as he walked, and he stiffened. But knew it would soon be over. As he predicted, after two or three seconds, they had turned away. Distracted by something else. And now I am as good as invisible. Just right. He bit back a smile as they walked across the marble floor and into the crowd. He scanned the room for Anselm, but he couldn't see him anywhere. He looked up at the ceiling and heartily wished he could float up through the window and disappear. He hated everything about the tun, the balls. The thin veil drawn over so much greed. He longed to escape it all. Amanda hated it as much as I do. When he looked down from his contemplation of the ceiling, he caught the eye of someone who was looking at him very fixedly. As he looked at him, he felt a twinge of recognition. Luke. He asked. By Nelson. Sutcliffe. The man replied. His broad face lit up. It's you. Welcome. I thought you decided to give all this up. So it's a real surprise to see you here today. I thought so, too. Henry nodded grimly. Is Anselm here? I came to meet him. Luke Steele, a friend of both of them from Cambridge. And the third son of an earl himself, nodded. Probably here somewhere. He's always here. I think he does it mainly to meet people he can stay with on hunting trips. But we'll find him. He smiled confidently. Good. Henry nodded. He felt his spirits lift. He felt much more calm now that he would be accompanied by people he knew. He raised a brow. Have you been here long already? Oh, about half an hour. Luke said, shrugging. I was just wondering if anyone I knew might turn up. I was feeling a little out of sorts. Just as well I spotted you. Grand to see you. He beamed happily at Henry. Henry smiled. It felt good. At least someone seemed happy with him. He looked around. Shall we find a drink? He asked. Luke grinned. Would I say no to such a fine offer? Thank you, Henry. You know what I like. Henry nodded. He wove his way awkwardly between groups, his legs still cramped after all those hours in the coach. Be careful, damn you. Somebody hissed. Henry stepped around the young lord, narrowly avoiding bumping into him. The young fellow scowled. He was flushed in the face. His cravat tied so high it brushed his chin and his calf simply padded. Henry looked away not wanting to make eye contact and provoke an argument. Excuse me? He said smoothly. I should hope so. The man said rudely. Henry deliberately looked the other way. Not interested in getting into an argument on his first night in town. He stared over at the stairway, and then his eyes widened. There were three ladies coming down the stairs together. One of them had brown hair in an elegant up style. One of them was dignified in a blue dress, her grey hair partly covered by a veil. And the third had dark hair, and a slim face, and was dressed in white lace. As he stared at her, her green eyes flickered to his. He almost stopped breathing. It was Lady Amanda. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. Chapter 10 Amanda stared into the room. She felt as if she might collapse. She knew who she thought she could see, standing over there not more than twenty paces from the stairs. But it couldn't really be him. She thought crossly. I left him in the country, three days ride from here. It cannot possibly be him. She peered down and realized she'd come to a halt in the middle of the steps when her grandmother pushed her gently. Amanda, keep moving. She hissed. Amanda made herself walk the last five steps down the stairs. She felt her head reel and looked up at the ceiling, trying desperately to focus. She looked around, trying to spot the man she had seen from the stairs. 
He looked so like Lord Sutcliffe. It couldn't possibly be him, though. He was still in the country. She hoped he knew she was here, but she had been given no chance to write to tell him of her leaving. She looked around searchingly, but couldn't spot the man. Amanda, come on. Look, it's Lady Sisley. Let's go and talk. Amanda looked wearily down at her sister, who was already heading off across the hallway and in the direction of a group of people. She couldn't believe she'd already spotted someone she knew. Amanda still felt dazed by the sheer volume of people. I can barely hear or see in such a crowded space. She had never been in a room so thickly packed with people. She could only shuffle forwards, and the noise and warmth were stifling. She followed Patricia through the throng. Amazed by how easily she slipped in between people. Seeming not to notice the din and the crowding. She followed Patricia to the group, and they stood together. While Patricia chatted away to a young woman of about her own age. Her hair in bunches of ringlets. She was wearing white, as were most ladies of about their age. Amanda noticed. Shyly. Patricia herself was wearing pale pink. Which also seemed to be a good color. Almost everyone who wasn't in white was in pink. With the odd handful of green dresses scattered among them too. I should have worn green. It suits me better. Amanda looked down at her feet, sure that she looked as uncomfortable as she felt. The noise was sawing through her ears and her head ached. She looked around, seeking escape. Her grandmother was standing by the door, talking to a group of older women. Nodding and laughing. Surely nobody would mind if she headed to the terrace for a moment. Just to take some fresh air? She looked around and tiptoed away from the group. As she was almost past them, a man spoke. Well, good evening, my lady. And where might you be going? May I fetch you some refreshment? Amanda stared. The man who had spoken to her was tall and not unappealing. Though his face was flushed, and she thought he had taken too much wine. He was somewhere between her age and her father's age. She judged, as his hair had a lot of grey in it. And his eyes were wrinkled at the edges. It wasn't anything about his appearance that scared her. He was square-jawed, grey-eyed and fairly handsome. But it was the way he studied her that made her shiver. He is looking at me like those men in the tea house did, only scarier. His hard eyes held her gaze. Flickering lower occasionally in a way that made her skin crawl. Just standing near him made her feel dirty, like she wanted to take a bath. She couldn't imagine why. Nothing she had ever faced in her world before had made her feel that way. My lady. He said, bowing low. I would like to introduce myself. I am the Duke of Avery. I am glad to meet you, Your Grace. Amanda said, and curtsied as prettily as she had been taught. I was just heading to the front steps to take the air. If you could excuse me? She smiled, and turned away. She could barely breathe with her urgent need for escape. Oh, good idea. I will accompany you. He said. Amanda shut her eyes. She felt fear wash through her body. Bad idea. Now he knows I am leaving the group, and he can talk to me alone. Somehow, even though she didn't even understand what scared her about him, she sensed that would be a bad idea. She looked around, wanting to think of some means to escape. Um, she said, trying to make her brain think of an excuse. Some reason why she should go out there alone. Just then, a low voice interrupted. Amanda, are you going to take care? And Lord Avery? Well. What a fine idea. Let's go too. Patricia invited the group with a smile. It's so stifling. Capital idea, Lady Patricia. A man drawled. Amanda glanced up at him. He was tall and slim, with thick sandy hair. Patricia was gazing up at him appreciatively. Amanda looked awa. Why, she was surprised to see her sister interested in anyone. 
and wanted to give her some privacy. At least the whole group will go together. It makes it safer for me to take the air. She glanced sideways at Patricia, not sure if she should thank her or not. She still wasn't sure if she was happy that they were all going out together. It offers me no chance to escape the Duke. She glanced up at him. He was walking determinedly next to her. And she had the awful feeling she wouldn't be able to dislodge him easily. She cast a glance at Patricia. Hoping her sister could think of something. But she was giggling at something her friend was saying and barely noticed her. She looked over to see if Grandmother had noticed them. Surely she would come to their rescue. But she was no longer where she had been. And Amanda felt a flutter of fear go through her. She truly was stuck with the Duke of Avery, unless she could think of some way to dislodge him herself. You've been in London long? The Duke drawled as they headed on to the wide front steps. Besides a footman by the door, the hallway was almost empty. The steps were empty too. Clearly nobody was still coming and going. Amanda frowned up at him. No, my lord, we arrived this morning. He laughed, as if she had said something clever. You haven't been to London before? She looked at her feet, not sure what to say. Somehow, some instinct screamed at her to lie about that. She cleared her throat. Yes, your grace. She murmured. Yes, you've been. Or yes, you haven't been? He asked her. He was smiling at her in that way that made her skin crawl. She looked at her feet. The second one, your grace. She whispered. I have never before been in London. Good. He said and his smile was frightening. Well, then. I have plenty of delights to show you. Amanda looked around desperately. She didn't understand why. But she was desperate to escape from this man. He confused and distressed her. And everything he said seemed to make no sense whatever. Um, my lord. I am feeling cold. I will fetch my shawl. She said, seizing on a reason to escape him. She looked over at the group. Patricia was looking at her. She wished she would think of something to say to him. Amanda, are you well? She asked with a frown. You look feverish. I'm fine. Amanda stammered. She frowned at Patricia. What would she ask her that? She was surely aware of how desperate she was to escape. We should leave early, if you feel off color. Patricia said quickly. Um, yes. Amanda said. Good. Mayhap, we should. She added. She wondered if it was possible to make it any clearer that she was desperate to leave. Without saying it explicitly. Patricia was talking to Lady Sisley, though. And she didn't hear her. Amanda winced. I have to get away now. I'll fetch something warm to wear. She said, trying to smile at the Duke. Then I'll return. Yes, my lady. He bowed and she turned away, hurrying back inside again. She stepped into the entrance hall, which was empty but for the patient footman. She let out a relieved breath. He was still outside, and she had escaped. Could I have my shawl, please? She asked one of the footmen who stood by the door. It's white, with white lace. Of course, my lady. He said and smiled at her. Is it this one? We have quite a few white shawls. Yes. Amanda said faintly. You do, yes. Almost all the young ladies were wearing white. And almost all the shawls were white as well. She found her shawl after about a minute of hunting through the pile. The lacy design made it distinct from the rest. And thanked the footman. She glanced over at the doors to the main road. Her spine tingling nervously. She was not going out there while he was still outside. She wrapped the shawl loosely around her shoulders. Taking a breath. She walked into the hall again. 
The fabric around her shoulders was fine lace and barely warm. But it made enough of a difference in the crowd. She was relieved to feel the extra warmth encounter with the Duke had left her feeling chilled inside. As she looked around the hall, looking for Lady Foley, she felt her heart thud. What if Lord Sutcliffe really was here? She recalled the man she had seen as they arrived. Nonsense, Amanda, she told herself firmly. It couldn't be him. He is miles away. All the same, when she scanned the room again for her grandmother, she was hoping she might spot him. She couldn't see his face anywhere close. She would have been surprised if she had been able to. As the crowd was so dense she could only see around twenty people. And she walked forward a little. Keeping to the space by the wall. She had plans to survey the entire room like this if need be. She was determined to find her grandmother and stick close to her for the remainder of the evening. It's quite fine to study the place from here, since it keeps me on this side of the room. She was not going near the entrance. Not until the Duke came back in. She looked around, scanning the crowd. She couldn't help but be impressed by the beauty of the space, too. Now she had a chance to study it. Crystal chandeliers hung down from a high, white ceiling. The roof was supported by occasional pillars. And these were clad in marble of pale colors. The floor was wooden, and the room was terribly warm. She could hear the deafening sound of a hundred people talking at the same time. And the air smelled of heat, beeswax and perfume. She looked up at the ceiling, admiring the designs worked into the plaster around the supports for the chandeliers. They were shaped like flowers, and she thought they were beautiful. She stared up at them and took root in the hall, suddenly full of admiration for the beauty around her. She was just straightening her neck when she heard a voice beside her. Lady Amanda. She stared. She lifted her hand to her lips and gasped. It was Lord Sutcliffe. Amanda looked up at him and felt her heart flooded with emotion. She smiled, and he smiled. And suddenly it felt as if the whole room had disappeared and it was just the two of them. Looking into one another's eyes. My lady. Lord Sutcliffe said and bowed low. I am. I don't know what to say. How came you to be here? She laughed. You ask me that? I might ask you the same. When did you travel here? Lord Sutcliffe frowned. I left on Wednesday, early in the morning. Oh. Amanda frowned. She had left on Tuesday. It was no wonder she did not know of his arrival. Well, I am so very pleased to see you. I thought I wouldn't see you for months. He looked at her with a big smile. I thought the same. I was deeply sad. Amanda felt joy flood through her body. She couldn't believe that he had missed her as much as she missed him. And yet she could see the truth in his eyes. She felt as if all the colors of the sunset had settled in her heart. It is remarkable that we happen to be here, together. She murmured. He nodded. I had some difficulties with my mother. It was why I came. It's better now he added, somewhat hastily. Amanda put her head on one side, feeling concerned. He looked so pained. She had to resist the urge to reach out and take his hand. I am glad it's better. She said softly. He nodded. Well, we're here, now. And I can happily forget about that. Yes. She murmured. She glanced across the crowds and saw her grandmother. She wasn't looking at them, but at any moment she was likely to spot them. And she felt a shiver of warning down her spine. Lord Sutcliffe frowned, and she realized it must have shown on her face. Sorry, my lord. Grandmother is over there, and... Well, I think it would be best if she didn't see us speaking. It would be better for us if your presence here were a secret. He raised a brow. I agree. He said softly. A secret it will remain. I will disappear into the crowd so as we do not draw too much attention to ourselves. 
Amanda nodded. Suddenly, having to be in London didn't seem too bad anymore. It was as if she and Lord Sutcliffe were co-conspirators in a beautiful secret. She smiled up at him, and he smiled back. And then she hurried away to lose herself in the crowd. She caught sight of Patricia and her grandmother. Patricia had just left the group she had been speaking to. They had all come in from the terrace. Amanda felt drew in a nervous breath. If only the Duke of Avery might forget about her. She would enjoy these weeks in London. Chapter 11 Amanda looked down at the street, feeling her stomach twist with a mix of happiness and excitement. It was daylight, and the town was quieter than it had been on the day they arrived. She could see people walking sedately about. And somewhere a coach rattled over the cobbles. The sound drifting in through the open windows of the drawing room. Amanda kept on thinking of the gathering at the Elmux and the meeting with Lord Sutcliffe. He is here and somehow I must see him again. She shut her eyes and tried to think clearly, though it was not exactly easy. She had two difficulties to overcome. And they were her grandmother's constant watchfulness and her plans to see her wed to anyone besides Lord Sutcliffe. She was still trying to think of some way of making her grandmother see her side of the story when she heard a creak and Patricia walked in through the door of the drawing room. There you are. She greeted her sister. I thought I'd stitch this bonnet. She suggested, sitting down in the big upholstered chair opposite Amanda. I might as well freshen it up with some new ribbon bows. Since father won't care any more if I change it from the way it was when he purchased it for me. Her voice was hard. She opened her basket and took out her sewing things. Amanda felt her chest tighten. She had noticed that her sister had taken their father's illness as a personal admission of uncaring. And she wished that she could convince her that he didn't mean it to be. She put her head on one side watching as her sister started to unpick the cream ribbons on the bonnet's silk. She had to say something, she decided, and cleared her throat. Patricia. You must know that father cares. He wouldn't have fallen ill and risked leaving us on purpose, she explained softly. Patricia looked up at her, brown eyes expressionless. He would. She said stubbornly, and bent down over the sewing. Ripping at the bow with small, sharp fingernails. He didn't say goodbye. He doesn't care any more. Ever since you became part of the family, he stopped loving me. All he cares about is you, now. Amanda stared at her sister. She was looking at Amanda with resentful, red-rimmed eyes. She shivered. She had never seen such hurt and such anger in one face. She took a breath. That's not true, surely you must know that. Of course, father loves you. He'll always love you. He didn't even say goodbye. Patricia said and ripped the old bow off firmly. He needed to talk to you, though. Grandmother told me he spoke to her and had a message to give you. He loves you and I don't matter to him any more. Amanda felt her a pain in her chest. But she had no idea what to say. She felt like the more she tried to argue the point, the more Patricia would insist it was true. This had clearly been festering for a long time. And Amanda had no idea what to say about it. She looked down at her hands, trying to collect herself. Father will be well when we return, she said softly. Until we do, we must try to do as he would expect us to. And that includes remembering his love. Patricia didn't say anything. But Amanda saw her rip off the other bow. And she stood to take her leave, aware of how angry her sister was. She paused in the hallway. Hearing her grandmother's raised voice. Oh, splendid. She said happily. If you could take it up to my room, please, Mr. Penning. I will be there directly. Where are my granddaughters? Amanda cleared her throat. Here, grandmother, she said, but her grandmother had already spotted them. She beamed happily and put out a hand to them in a gesture of joy. Ladies, such terrific news. 
We are invited to a ball at Lady Wellington's. Now, this is an honor. We must be sure to get your best gowns ready. Amanda felt her stomach twist. She always found being at parties awkward, and here. They were even more nerve-wracking and tense. When, Grandmother? She asked. Her voice was so soft that Grandmother didn't hear her speak. Patricia did, though, but said nothing to alert Grandmother. Oh, what a fine opportunity. Her Grandmother continued, oblivious. All the gentlefolk will be there. The whole ton. She said, raptly. And you might meet dukes and earls and, well, all manner of fine gentlemen. I insist you wear the green gown, Amanda. And you the cream, I think, Patricia? She raised a brow. My new gown is blue. I'll wear that, Grandmother. Patricia said firmly. Their grandmother looked as if she was going to gainsay her, but at the last minute, she just shrugged. Oh, fine. Well, then. Blue or green or cream? Just make sure you look splendid, granddaughters. I cannot wait. She clasped her hands happily. When is it? Amanda managed to say. Her voice was loud in the sudden silence. Oh, no shouting, my child. Her grandmother said, though her voice was light. It's tomorrow night. Amanda looked at her in shock. Tomorrow night? They had a tea outing today, and then they were going to a ball the next evening? Their grandmother seemed unaware of the shock. Well, then? She said. Off you go. If I were you, I'd be airing my gown already. And looking at pictures of hairstyles. This is a fine event, and you should be well prepared. She beamed as if this was an encouragement. Amanda nodded and headed upstairs to her bedroom. Planning for the ball did not take nearly as long as her grandmother seemed to think it would. The green dress had already been chosen for her, though she and Joanna both thought the cream was more suitable. And she left the choice of a hairstyle up to Joanna. If it had been her own choice, she would have worn it just as she did every day, in loose ringlets. But she was sure that would not be enough for a ball with the modish nobles of London. The next evening, before they were ready to depart, her new maid came in with a copy of the Women's Monthly Gazette. She had it open on a page that showed pictures of hairstyles. She pointed at one. This, my lady? She asked with a frown. I heard these were frightfully sought after in London circles. Amanda looked down and felt oddly indifferent. The design was a chignon, with the hair at the front ring litted about the face. It was quite elaborate, and something Amanda would never have chosen for herself. She put her head on one side. If Grandmother approves of it, then that is what we will do. She just raised a brow. Very well, then, my lady. Amanda watched as she combed the long dark strands of her hair. It reached down her back, and her maid started to curl it around the wooden cylinder. Brushing it so it was glossy. We might need to use the curling tongs for this, my lady. These loose curls won't do for London. Amanda shut her eyes. It felt like a betrayal of one of her own inner convictions. However silly it might sound. She felt that if she let that happen, she would have stepped back and a new Amanda would be in her place. One that was a stranger to her. If you think it necessary. She said softly. Her maid went to heat the tongs in the fire. After what felt like an age, Amanda looked at herself in the mirror. She wore the long blue-green dress, that shimmered in the candlelight. The silky fabric catching the flame light and winked brighter and then darker in turn. Her hair was elaborately curled, and she felt as if she was looking at a stranger. Is that me? Her maid chuckled. Of course, it is you, my lady. Who else could it be? You look lovely. Thank you. Amanda whispered. She looked at the pale, scared face behind all the elaborate styling, and wondered if anyone would notice. 
they will just see the hair and the dress and not care too much who is inside. This world was like none that she'd ever imagined, and it scared her somewhat. She heard footsteps in the hallway and put aside her fears, getting ready to head down to the coach. Ask, Amanda. You look beautiful. Their grandmother declared as soon as she saw her. I have two lovely granddaughters, do I not? She beamed at Patricia, who smiled back. Though Amanda thought her eyes looked cold. Amanda lifted the green silk skirt of her gown and followed her grandmother. Resplendent in navy. Down the stairs. Patricia's blue spangled muslin rustled as she walked. Amanda thought she looked quite lovely. If only she could forgive me for her perception that father puts me first, it would be so easy to be friends with her again. She glanced at Patricia as they got into the coach. Her sister was talking to their grandmother. And she knew that, whatever she herself said, it would be misinterpreted. Especially anything about their father. The merest mention of who might make Patricia feel angry with her again. Best to keep silent and wait for her to realize that fact by herself. She leaned back and watched as the darkened town moved swiftly past their coach. The venue for the ball was a tall and deceptively narrow structure. Amanda frowned at the doorway as the coach drew up outside. Is that it? Patricia asked, echoing what they must all be thinking. Ask. Their grandmother chuckled. Don't be deceived. The house might look small and unassuming, but that was what the architect must have wished. Inside, it is a different matter entirely. Amanda was surprised to see her grandmother looking so light-hearted. She seemed to thrive in town, becoming more alive and happy. They followed her up the steps to the door. Your card, my lady? The man who answered the door asked. Amanda tried to see past her grandmother as they waited on the step. Her curiosity almost bubbling inside her. She could see the tall, dark door. But beyond it all she could see was bright candlelight. Ask. Here we are. Her grandmother murmured, and drew out a small card on stiff parchment. Which Amanda knew had her name on it in florid calligraphy. Good evening, Lady Foley. Welcome. The man said, his manner becoming decidedly more genial now that he knew who they were. Amanda looked up, feeling impatient. As he stepped aside and let them step in. Her first thought was to be completely awestruck. The unassuming exterior gave way to a vaulted hallway. The height of which meant the ceiling was almost lost in the darkness that gaped above them. The floor was of marble, and the stairs which faced them were elaborately decorated too. This way, my lady. The footman said. He led them to the right. Amanda held her breath as she walked down the steps into the ballroom. The space was vast. The ceiling high and the vaulting supported on marble-clad columns. The floor was checkered and the steps she took seemed to echo in the space. She glanced back at her grandmother, who was talking to their hostess. And then at Patricia, who was walking across to the refreshment table. There were hardly any other guests there, and Amanda swallowed queasily. She was leaning on a pillar, looking up at the ceiling, when she heard a voice beside her. Why, Lady Amanda? I had no idea you would be here this evening. Her skin crawled and she turned around to find herself looking into the face of the Duke from the previous evening. Your Grace. She said, and took a step back, almost involuntarily. He was standing close to her, his body crowding her against the pillar. He bowed low, and she dropped a curtsy. Feeling her stomach twist with discomfort. Please. Call me Wentworth. He said softly. Amanda gaped. Your Grace. I can't do that. We barely know each other. She said, then colored as she realized she had no place to be telling the Duke how to have manners. She looked at her toes and wished her grandmother might spot them. It would be grand if she could come to my rescue. He chuckled, a sound that might have been good-natured. But on him did not sound it. 
She looked up and his dark eyes held hers and they looked almost scornful. As you wish, my lady. You seem to like keeping your distance. Most engaging. I always did like the chase. Amanda stared at him. How was she supposed to respond? If he was going to assume that all her attempts to avoid him were meant to make him interested. There was no getting away. Um, your grace. I assure you, I am not meaning to be hunted. He laughed. Well, my dear. That is what makes it so piquant. He grinned at her, and his dark eyes were touched with warmth. He was an arm's length away from her, which seemed too close. Amanda felt as if she was frozen to the spot with shock. She had no idea what to say or do. She let her eyes move fractionally to the doorway, but her grandmother was talking to someone else. Standing with her back to them. She tried to think of a polite way to extricate herself. But she didn't know of one, and so she just stood where she was. Numb from shock and with her mind racing. You seem lost for words. The duke said with a smile. My poor sweeting. You're not used to life in town, are you? My, but you stir the blood. Amanda felt like her knees would give way. She was still frozen, but this time her grandmother drifted over and the spell broke. Amanda bobbed a curtsy. Excuse me, your grace. But I feel unwell. I need to take refreshment and perhaps take the air. She turned around and practically ran to the table. She was standing there, a glass of black currant cordial in her hand. Trying to fight for calm. When she heard her grandmother come to join her. She looked up at her. Wanting to ask for help. Or at least to explain her headlong flight across the room. But her grandmother grinned happily. My dear girl. That's his grace. The Duke of Avery. I am amazed. He's horrible, Grandma. Amanda whispered. Her grandmother laughed. My dear girl. He is ten thousand pounds a year. And he's one of the primary peers of the realm. And he asked me permission to court you. Of course, I granted it directly. Oh, this is terrific. She was positively glowing. She brushed a curl of hair out of her eyes and beamed at her granddaughter happily. Amanda shivered. How could she do that? How could she? She felt as if she was in a nightmare. Her heart was pounding and it was very difficult for her to breathe. She glanced sideways at Patricia, who had suddenly come to join them. Her sister was frowning at her, and looked confused. Amanda felt her knees wobble. Please. She said, as her eyes clouded over. The result of the tight stays and the added terror of the evening. And her knees wobbled. I need to go home. She felt herself lose consciousness, and the last thing she recalled hearing as she fell over was her grandmother's voice. Asking what exactly was going on. She woke some time later, blinking as candlelight hurt her eyes. She shut them again and wondered for a fearful moment where she was. The last thing she recalled was the ballroom, and her grandmother. And that awful man. Then darkness. Grandmother? She called out. Patricia? Are you there? I'm here. A weary voice said. She recognized it as that of her grandmother. You're at Foley House, in your bedchamber. You collapsed at the ball. I have spoken with Joanna about the tightness of your stays. Fashionable it might be, but it is more efficacious if you can also breathe. She made a small noise that could have been a chuckle. Amanda tensed, feeling how her head still ached. Her grandmother sounded almost amused. She wasn't sure how she felt about that. She tried to sit up. Grandmother. How did I get here? We brought the coach around. A footman carried you out. It was. Fairly theatrical. I must ask you never to do something like that again. Her voice was harsh. Grandmother. Amanda protested. That was unfair. 
I had not the slightest intention of. Oh. Pain lanced through her scalp again and she shut her eyes, lying back down. Could her grandmother not just leave her alone? You might not have meant it, but the Duke was most offended. I had to spend a good ten minutes calming him down. You might try not to cause trouble, young lady. Amanda felt her body stiffen at the thought of the Duke. She felt worse than weary. She felt ill. Had her grandmother truly supported the man? She wanted to protest, but she felt far too weary. Please, grandmother. She murmured. Let me sleep a while? She heard her grandmother shift in the seat and she thought she must be standing up to go. Amanda kept her eyes shut. She felt too tired to open them. I think it is best if I go. Her grandmother said stiffly, all humor gone from her voice. I will see you tomorrow. There is much I have to say. Yes. Amanda whispered. She stayed where she was, waiting for her grandmother to leave the room. When she had gone she tried to sit up and get her bearings. She felt awful, and, when she thought about her grandmother's words, she felt frightened. Would nobody let her get away from the Duke? She lay back and shut her eyes again and tried to make a plan. She was not going to let her grandmother do this to her. She would have to think of something. She would not let her do this to her. Not now, when she had Henry Sutcliffe to lose. The thought made her feel strong. When she lay back down to rest, it was the thoughts of Henry. And she was smiling as she drifted into sleep. Chapter 12 Henry walked down the street in Covent Garden, feeling the morning breeze on his skin. It was not particularly cold, but his fingers were tingling from the chill. He drew his greatcoat about him and turned right, planning to go to a coffee house. He had escaped his own less than salubrious accommodation, and come into the nicer area of town specifically intending to take coffee somewhere. I can have a hot drink and make my plans for what to do next. He was just about to enter the building when he heard raised voices, coming from just around the corner. It was a quiet area of town, and the sound made him stiffen though the words were not being shouted. Without meaning to, he found himself listening. Think of what this will do for your family if you take this chance. I have put so many hours into teaching you your manners. You have a glorious opportunity here, and you need to take it. Henry frowned. He didn't know why the tone of that voice hurt his heart. He supposed it was because he had heard his own parents say such similar things sometimes. He didn't want to pay too much notice to what was clearly someone else's business. But he glanced around the corner and took a look at who was speaking so harshly. A tall woman with grey hair was standing on the steps near a fountain. She was facing a young woman, whose bonnet showed a curl of dark hair. With a shock, he recognized the grey day coat, the cream skirt and something about the profile of the girl. Amanda, it cannot be. He hastily pulled his head back around the corner, so that they wouldn't spot him. The older woman continued and he stayed where he was and listened from behind the shelter of the wall. He was worried for Amanda. Now, that you are going to accept that invitation. Are we in agreement? He heard Amanda take a breath in. Yes, grandmother. As he watched, the older woman's posture shifted, so that he could almost see the relief of tension from here. Good. Now, I am going back into the tea house to fetch Patricia. You can wait here for me, if you will. Or take a look in those windows. But don't go far, mind. I shan't be long. Henry stood where he was, and as soon as her grandmother had gone into the tea house, he ran up to her. My lady. He bowed. Good morning. Lord Sutcliffe. She said. Her voice sounded tragic and, to his horror, he could see tears in her eyes. My lady. He said, and reached into his pocket for his handkerchief, which he passed to her. Forgive my intrusion, but... What is the matter? She sniffed. Nothing, my lord. 
She was dabbing at her eyes, and he could see plainly that she was distressed. I mean, really, nothing. Just a little upset, that is all. Henry's chest ached with feeling. He wanted to take her in his arms and hold her close. To take her back with him in the coach and never let that awful woman shout at her like that again. But he could not do that, of course. And he didn't want to embarrass her by letting her know he'd seen the interaction. If there is aught I can do, please tell me, my lady. You know I am at your service. Amanda sniffed again, and this time she smiled up at him. You are kind. She said softly. Henry stared at her, feeling bewildered. That was so unlike her. She had shouted at him, teased him, laughed with him. She had never been so subdued and quiet. And he found that he hated to see her this way. My lady. I will always help you. It's no kindness at all. I want to help. I know there is something the matter. I know it must be grave, for I've never seen you in this state. I can't leave you here like this. We need to do something. I have let this go on for too long. Please, send for me if you need any help at all. He reached into his pocket, but suddenly realized he couldn't give her his card. He wasn't staying at Sutcliffe House. The address that was printed on the parchment. Before he could start to explain that fact, she gasped. Here comes Grandmother. She whispered. Please, Lord Sutcliffe. Don't let her see you. I must run. He nodded, concern stealing his breath. Of course, my lady. I hope to see you soon. Maybe. I cannot say. I hope so, too, she hissed. Then, before he could say anything more, she had disappeared around the corner and into the street lined with merchants' shops. Glass windows displaying their wares. He turned away. He was just walking back to the road where the tea house was when he spotted her grandmother. She had gone to join Amanda down the road. Henry turned away, feeling his skin crawl with discomfort. What was that about? What was she persuading Amanda to do? He could feel his heart thudding. He was terrified for her. Whatever was going on, he knew it must be something awful. He had never seen her so distressed. Even her father's illness had not distressed her in quite the same way. He headed up into the tea house, still frowning. He wanted desperately to help her, but he had no idea what to do. He considered marching straight to Foley House and taking her away with him. He knew it would do no good, though. He needed to arrange his own life before he could help her satisfactorily. I must meet with father. He shut his eyes and ran a hand down his face. He would do that, but not before he'd purchased a commission. He wasn't letting his parents take his livelihood away in exchange for his freedom. Not any more. A cup of coffee, my lord? The proprietor asked him as he paused to hang up his coat. Henry shrugged. Yes, please. And have you a copy of the Gazette? Of course, my lord. I will fetch it for you now. Henry nodded his thanks and went to sit at the table facing the door. He accepted the Gazette and flipped idly through it, not particularly interested but feeling a need to avoid anybody coming over to talk. His mind was racing and he felt the need to think and plan on his own. She has no way to call on me, but I know where Foley House is. He leaned back in his chair and wondered what to do. He could certainly go to her house. But he wasn't sure if that would be a good plan. Or if it would make things even harder. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully. His tea arrived and he thanked the proprietor and sipped it. Letting the rich, dark fluid wake him and soothe him with its calming smell. The place was filling up now, and he coughed as someone smoked a pipe somewhere in the back tables. He hated the smell of tobacco, himself. He could hear the murmur of voices, and someone chuckled nearby, whispering something to their companions. I have two problems to solve. First, I need to try to help Lady Amanda, and secondly, 
I need to find a way to settle in London. If I cannot find and speak to my father first. He shut his eyes. He knew that the easiest thing would be to go to Sutcliffe House, where he presumed his father was staying, and request a meeting with him. The thought of his father's betrayal bubbled up inside him, and he couldn't bear thinking of confronting him. It would be one thing if he had told me himself. He noticed his hand had made a fist, and that he was in danger of squashing the gazette too much. He unclasped his hands and let the paper drop to the table his eyes shutting as he did so, lost in thought. It seemed clear that meeting with his father was out of the question. At least for the next while. His next best plan was to go to army headquarters and see about buying a commission. He pushed back his chair and stood. He paid for his tea, returned the newspaper, and shrugged on his coat. It had become colder outside, and he drew it tight about him. Hands in pockets, his boots keeping out the cold from the grey flagstones underfoot. He walked down the pavement, a frown on his brow. He was so preoccupied that he didn't notice Lord Anselm, who was standing in front of him. By Nelson. Is that you? His old friend said. His thin face lit up with a grin. Henry stepped back, getting a shock. He would have walked straight into him he realized awkwardly. Anselm. I wasn't expecting to see you here. He said. He bowed and his friend chuckled. You dash twelve should have, Henry. My house is just over there. Whatever are you doing out here? It's called for a morning constitutional. Henry nodded. It is, yes. I'm glad I bumped into you. I was just considering heading over to the headquarters and perhaps discuss the purchase of positions. By Nelson. You don't want to be doing that, do you? Anselm said with a frown. Henry shrugged. It was the easiest way for a gentleman to earn his own wealth. He had no particular skills, and even should he have had, actually working was something that would see him forever barred from the tonne. The army was the only respectable profession for a gentleman. I thought about it. He admitted. Well, don't think any more, Anselm said. He sounded angry. It's no place for you. They might send you to Portugal and then you'll have your knees blown off by a poxy Frenchman. Come back to my house and I'll talk some sense into you. Henry couldn't help smiling. He had always appreciated his friend's frankness, and it was no exception now. He allowed himself to be led to his friend's home. He found himself seated on a big comfortable chair in the drawing room. Faced with a tray that had tea and sandwiches of all description piled onto it. Henry felt somewhat restored by the fine surroundings and the delicious food, and the warmth and easy conversation. He felt almost in good humor after an hour of arguing with Anselm and his mind returned to the events of the morning. I met someone I know from the country in town this morning. He began awkwardly. He had never discussed his relationships with Anselm, and doing so made him feel quite self-conscious. Oh? Anselm frowned. What manner of person? Henry went red. A lady, Anselm. Oh. His friend sat forward in his chair. Do tell. I haven't seen a lady for an awfully long time. Something of another species, they are. He chuckled. More distant from me than some rare wildlife of the Indies. Henry grinned. I don't believe you. He said lightly. But anyhow. I admire her so, Anselm. And mother and father are being difficult so I'm here in London to try and make my own way. The more he talked about it, the more confident he felt. He knew he had to find his own livelihood and make a life he could offer Amanda. He just had no idea how to get started, and he hoped Anselm could help him. His friend sighed. That seems easy enough. You didn't seem to have much difficulty in getting your own way before. You got to study classics at Cambridge, just like you wanted and then you left even though she intended you to stay another year. He trailed off as Henry coughed. 
That's not what I mean. He said sorrowfully. I mean my own cash, Anselm. Mother's not disinterested in this, like when I was studying. In this case, she's made father agree with her. They're threatening disownment. What? Anselm shook his head, his eyes wide with disbelief. No, friend. There's something strange there. Your father waited forty years to sigh you. He wanted an heir more than he wanted breath. You are his world and he would never disown you. Henry sighed. He had believed the same. That his father valued him as an heir. He had never thought any different, until those words his mother had thrown so carelessly at him. I don't know any more. He admitted. He looked up as Anselm leaned back in his chair, stretching his long legs out under the table. He looked deep in thought, and Henry felt guilty for a moment. For having imposed his problems on him like this. He cleared his throat to speak, but his friend spoke first. If I were you, I'd try to find out about that. He said. I mean, about your father's disownment threat. No. Henry said, a little too quickly. I mean, I don't want to plead with him. He was surprised by how harsh he sounded. Anselm raised a brow. You really were hurt by that, weren't you? He asked. Yes, Henry admitted. He was right. He had been hurt and, what was more, his pride was hurt. Whether he was going to be able to overlook that, or whether his pride was too fragile to allow him to confront his father, he wasn't sure yet. Anselm chuckled. You always were a stubborn sort, Henry. Want to come drinking with us? It'll take your mind off it. When? Henry asked. He was not a heavy drinker by any description, but right now the thought was tempting. More than the drink and the promise of forgetting. He ached to spend time in the company of old friends. On Tuesday. Peculiar day of the week, I know. Anselm grinned. But it's the day that the caterwauling contest happens at the building next door. What? Anselm laughed. The Royal Opera House, Henry. It's the night of the opera, and you know what Luke is like. He'll want to go around the back to meet all the beautiful singers. And so he always wants us to drink at the club right across the street. He's the only one in the least interested in the opera, so it's the closest he'll get any of us to go. But we have to meet there and drink until he comes out again. It's the only way we'll see him in the week. He's always off somewhere. So it's the only chance the Cambridge Club of Truants can have to ever see one another. Henry laughed. The four of them. He, Anselm, Luke, and Rackford. Had made the club together in their first year. They had spent his first season in London together too. But they'd fallen out of communicating when he went to the country with his father. It felt good to be back in touch once again. Well, I'd be delighted to be there. He said with a nod. The club is near the opera house? Yes. It's about two streets away. I'll show you if you have a pencil and paper. Henry looked about for one, and waited while his friend drew a rough map. When it was done, he tucked it into his pocket. Grand. He said. And thank you. I am glad you shared your advice with me. Oh. Anselm grinned, sitting up straight in his chair again. That is a surprise. Henry, thanking me? I should have the town crier shout it out, that's such a rare event. Henry laughed and made a face at him. They both chuckled. Anselm. He said when they'd stopped laughing. I do need to make plans for my future, though. I can't go to my father and demand he reinstate my inheritance. I want to know I can walk away if I have to. Anselm raised a brow. Well, as it happens, I can help with that. Our fellows have a sort of agreement. We all choose industries to invest in, and Luke works it out. He's the treasurer. 
we can try and find a venture that'll give good returns, and you can invest something. How much have you in the account at the moment? Pardon the rudeness of that. He added quickly. Henry frowned. Well, I have a thousand pounds. Maybe two. I'd need to check. He put his head on one side and looked at Anselm carefully. He wasn't at all sure about the wisdom of letting his three friends invest his money. But, if Anselm believed they could make money that way, well, it was worth considering it. Grand. Anselm nodded. Well, when we meet on Tuesday at the club near the Opera House, and we'll talk with the fellows, I know they'll think of something. When he arrived home an hour later, Henry sat down wearily on his bed and eased off his boots. He recalled Amanda's worried, fearful face and he felt the memory like a physical pain. He longed to do something to help her. He felt nervous about this investment plan of Anselm's. But if it would help him make a way in the world, well, he was going to try. He felt a tingle of excitement at the thought of making his fortune and making a life for them both. Chapter 13 Amanda looked around at the door as her grandmother walked in. She was dressed in a flowing blue gown, her grey hair piled elaborately and covered with the briefest of veils, as was appropriate for her widowhood status. Amanda thought she looked wonderfully elegant, which didn't make her feel more confident or less scared. My child, you look as if you were ready to go? Amanda nodded. Grandmother, I don't want to do this. Grandmother beamed. The candlelight caught the silver thread in her shawl and made it sparkle. It was dark outside, the curtains long since drawn on the night. Now till then. You know this is a wonderful opportunity. Many young ladies would rail against you for this wonderful chance. Spending time with a wealthy duke. And you have taken it up with both hands. Go and have a terrific evening, my dear. Amanda felt sick. She looked down at her hands. They rested on a blue silk skirt. The color bringing out the color of her own eyes. Her hair was ringletted about her face. The tight, highly styled curls from the tongs. And she thought she looked like an empty, decorated ballroom. Nobody present to speak of, but all frightfully clean and modish. She looked at her grandmother. How long is the opera? She asked. Her voice was soft. If she knew how long she would have to endure this, she would feel a little better about it. Why, child? Her grandmother laughed. It's Figaro. Didn't we read it together just two days ago? You commented then that it must be three hours at least. And you were quite right. She beamed. She seemed to be in a good mood this evening. Amanda nodded, feeling sick. It was three hours, she judged. And it was going to be three hours of fear and discomfort. The Duke has insisted I sit in his personal box. She pushed the thought away and made herself go to the door. If she thought about it, she would be sick. She had passed out at the first ball she'd met him, which said volumes about the way she felt for him. It had been then that he'd invited her to the opera as a means to apologize for whatever he'd done to upset her. She wished he hadn't. Grandmother is delighted. Surely she can see what a frightening person he is? She wished she could say something, tell her about how sick she felt whenever the Duke looked at her. About how her skin crawled at the things he said sometimes. But the things he said and the way he stared made her feel ashamed, and shame silenced her voice. I'll go downstairs. Patricia is waiting in the hallway. Her grandmother interrupted her thoughts. She will be right beside me in the gallery, and I'm quite glad about it. I am so excited to attend this performance. Amanda nodded and shut her eyes, wishing she could shut out the whole evening. She reached for her fan and her little purse that held her handkerchief and perfume. She nodded to her maid, who came in with her gloves and coat. Thank you. I will leave now, she said, turning to follow her grandmother downstairs. I'll wait for you to return, my lady. Amanda thanked her, 
feeling guilty. They would not be back until after midnight, she was sure. Amanda wished she could excuse Joanna from her duties, but she would need her help to get ready for bed. Patricia stood beside their grandmother by the door. She was wearing cream lace and looked beautiful, her gown paired with lots of pearls. Her grey hair shone glossily in the light. She looked up at Amanda wordlessly. Are we ready, granddaughters? Her grandmother asked, wrapping herself in a pelisse. Let's go. She seemed oblivious to the strained quiet between her two granddaughters. She and Patricia climbed into the coach after grandmother, and neither of them said anything the entire journey. Amanda wondered about the silence. But guessed Patricia was still angry with her for what she perceived as stealing father's affection. She said nothing and the town rattled past in the blue darkness as the coach headed down the narrow streets. As they neared the opera house, the darkness was cut through with torchlight. The building was lit up by bracketed torches, and Amanda took a breath in at the sheer height of it. Grandmother alighted first, and they followed her up into the gracious building. She seemed to have shed years, and floated up the steps to the terrace. They followed her silently. Amanda couldn't help looking around her. The place was palatial, she thought. And she found her heart lifting at the beauty of the surroundings. The opera house was huge, to her eye at least, made out of sandstone. Huge columns grew from the font, supporting the roof that disappeared somewhere into the starry dark. They followed Grandmother in through the entrance. Then along a corridor and out through wide doors onto a terrace. Passing a footman who stood by the entrance. Outside on the terrace, the air was cool and pleasant. People stood and talked in low voices, and there was a scent of perfume in the air. Amanda looked out over the edge, staring at buildings around them. The outline of roofs shone silver in the moonlight, the shadows black and blue. The town was silent, and, but for the voices nearby, she could have been alone. Being alone, leaning on the rail, the fear suddenly felt almost unbearable once more. Mother, if you can help me, I wish you would. She sent the cry for help up through the darkness and to the distant stars. She didn't know if anyone had heard. She listened to the sound of the voices around her and the rustle of the wind in leaves. Be proud of yourself, sunshine. She jumped as the words came vividly back to her memory. She had forgotten her mother saying that. She said it often, as she brushed her long hair out before they went into the village on Sundays. Or when Amanda danced to the sound of the village pipe band. Remembering that hurt. Somehow, that feeling of pride had deserted her just lately. She had lost it underneath her grandmother's words and lessons. Her constant exhortations to be a lady. As if it was something she could not be. She tucked the memory of her mother's smile away. The feeling of pride in herself along with it. Then she walked back along the terrace to join her grandmother. Ah, dear child. There you are. Her grandmother greeted, surprisingly good-naturedly. We were just about to go in. It's a little chilly out here, and the Duke will be wondering where we are. She beamed. Yes. Amanda whispered. She felt numb with sudden terror. It was easy to be brave without the thought of being confronted with him. Now, she felt a fresh wash of fear. She followed her grandmother and Patricia inside, lagging behind them slowly. Ah, my dear ladies. The Duke said as they walked toward the entrance. Amanda shut her eyes a moment before she looked at him, the fear overwhelming her. He was red in the face, his cravat tied high under his chin. He bowed low and looked up at Amanda, his eyes seeming almost mocking as they rested on her. She looked away, queasily. Your Grace. Her grandmother said, dropping a curtsy. Oh, how delightful to see you. You must take Amanda to her seat. We will enter via the gallery. We won't be far away. She added with a wink. My lady, I admire your unparalleled devotion to your dear grandchildren. Amanda could hear the mockery in that tone, and she was sure her grandmother must be able to hear it. 
she looked away. Her grandmother and Patricia were going toward the entrance to the gallery, leaving her alone with him. You accepted my invitation. He said. He was smiling at her, and Amanda felt her nails scratch her palms, her hands balled up. Yes. She said, the words tight. My grandmother was very conscious of the honor you do me with it. He chuckled, not noticing the bitter tone. She's a sensible one. He said. And I am glad you accepted. Come, let us go to our box. Amanda wanted to run. But he was standing back for her, and she had to follow him through the doors and into the hall. It was grand. She had to admit it was grand. She stared at the red padded interior, the curtain's vast swathes of velvet, the coat of arms hanging high over the top. The whole place reeked of wealth. The box was grand inside, too. Pale velvet covering two vast seats, the rails made of iron wrought into beautiful shapes. It was luxurious and, presently, almost silent. She sat down carefully on the upholstered seat and peered over the edge of the box. They could see into the box next door, where a dandy and a lady sat, peering over the audience together. She relaxed, but moved a little to the right as the Duke took a seat beside her. He was lolling close to her, his knee almost touching her own. She sat stiffly upright. Now t then, he said, slurring slightly. This is the start of the thing. We'll sit here for ages while the fellows get everybody to their seats and then put out the lamps. Then the action begins. He grinned at her. Amanda looked away, nauseated. She was only half listening to him, her attention occupied with wanting to escape here. She looked out over the audience and made herself focus on the stage. The Duke seemed content to sit without talking. She watched as the hall filled with people and then as men clad in black started to snuff out the lights. She stared out over the audience in the darkness, trying to ignore the fact that the Duke was precariously close. She could hear his breath. And she felt something rub against her leg. She stiffened, and the feeling disappeared. She shut her eyes and tried to get a grip on herself. You're imagining things, Amanda. He wouldn't actually try to touch you. She stared out at the stage as, after what seemed like an age, the overture started. She sat up, entranced. She loved music, and this was something remarkable. She had never heard a full orchestra before, and the sound was deafening. Transporting. Wonderful. She felt her foot tap in time with the music and for a moment she could forget about the Duke's presence beside her. Her attention was broken as the first singer came on. She had never heard anything like it before. She was surprised that she was pleased they'd come. She loved the music. As the opera progressed, and she felt herself relax, the pressure on her leg returned. She jumped. This time, she was absolutely sure what it was. It was a hand on her knee. She froze. Creeping nausea flooded her body. She had never had anyone touch her like that before and she felt a flood of shame. He thinks I chose to be here. He thinks I wished for... for this. She swallowed hard. She wanted to be sick. She realized that a sob had escaped her when his hand lifted off her leg. Maybe he won't do it again. She shut her eyes and made herself think only of the music. She felt absolute urgent fear in every part of her body. She had to escape. She could not sit here next to this disgusting man one second longer. She glanced sideways, and he grinned at her. She looked instantly away. She couldn't let him look at her like that, speak to her like that, and touch her like that. She glanced backwards at where the door had been. She could see a dark curtain. They pulled the curtain over the door. I heard them pull it shut. She took a breath and tried to make her heart stop thumping tried to think clearly, make an escape strategy. The hall was in Covent Garden. Not too far from their house. She could almost remember the way to it. If she ran, she would be able to get back home. Where her maid would be expecting her. 
Grandmother would be furious, but it would be one way to make it clear how much she hated it. She will never forgive me. She will say I have thrown all her education back at her face. She shut her eyes and leaned back. The two longings. To please her grandmother and to escape further humiliation. Warring quite strongly inside her. As she leaned back, she felt the hand again. This time, it was on her shoulder, the fingers moving under the sleeve of her gown. She flinched and tried to ignore it. She was too frightened to move and too frightened to cause a scene. Too scared of what her grandmother would say. What was she, after all? She was nothing, without her grandmother's education. She wouldn't be here without that. She was no lady. Be proud, sunshine. She swallowed hard. The hand was still on her shoulder, but now the audience was clapping. And the curtain was lowering down. Was it the end of the first act already? She had no idea. She hadn't been aware of time passing. She felt his fingers brush her skin. And then she stood and, whirling around, she ran to the back of the box. She could hear him following her, and she scrabbled desperately behind the curtain, grabbing for the handle. She needed to find it. She needed to get out of here fast, before he caught her. She heard the creaking of his chair as he stood, ready to come over in pursuit of her. She found the handle and pushed open the door, then ran out into the hallway. It was empty, only two footmen up at the one end, folding table linen. She ran past and they looked at her, then looked quickly away. I need to get to the stairs and fast. Her shoes were thin soled and she could feel the cold floor through them and almost slipped twice on the stone tiling. But she didn't stop running. She lifted her skirt out of the way, and, as she reached the bend in the staircase, she heard footsteps, heavy ones, nearing. No. He was following her. She ran down across the entrance hall and out into the street. There, she paused for a second, blinded in the sudden darkness. She could see and hear nobody and nothing. She was alone on the street. She would have stayed there to get her bearings. But she heard feet. Booted and loud. On the marble. No. This time, the word was a cry on her lips. She ran to the left, sure that had been the direction from which they'd come. She was on the cobble street now. And she knew that she could not run properly on that surface, not in her small thin-soled shoes. Feeling desperate. She ran harder, trying to get to the stone pavement where, at least, it was easier to balance. Her feet ached. Her lungs burned. She felt her heart thudding fit to burst. She ran and then someone grabbed her arm, pulling her off balance. She screamed, and the Duke dragged her toward him. So, he said, he wasn't smiling now. His face was flushed with anger, his eyes hard. You thought you could run away. There are some games I don't like. I will not be made a fool of. I wasn't making a fool. She began. He glared at her. You think the whole of London won't laugh at me if they hear you escaped me? No. I won't have it. No one makes a fool of me. Amanda felt her stomach twist, and she wanted to be ill. She wrenched her arm away but he was too strong. And she felt suddenly helpless. You taunt me and play your flighty games with me? He said, dragging her into the light from a window. And then you run out of the theatre? His eyes were slit and his words hit like blows. No. I will not be cheated or thwarted. You will be mine now. I cannot let you escape me. Amanda stared. She had a sudden inkling that he was not quite sane. Who in their right mind would take someone running away from them as an incitement to pursue them? Please. She said softly. Let me go. You cannot force me to do anything. He laughed. You think that? Let me tell you. Nobody can deny me anything. I'm the Duke of Avery, and sooner or later I will get what I want. 
all London seeks my favor. Amanda shut her eyes. She had not realized before how power was the only thing that turned his head. She felt sick. She wanted to be ill, but, more than that, she had to escape. She felt tired. So tired. Please. She whispered. Let me go. I promise I won't tell anyone I ran away. We can even go back to the theater. She trailed off as he growled. No. You are going to come back to my home. You will not escape me, and if I have taken you, your grandmother will give you away as if you were rags or offal. Amanda stared at him. He couldn't mean that. He couldn't mean. No. She screamed. She kicked him, and the sudden shock made him loosen his grip just for an instant. He didn't stop, and she ran on. Her feet slipping on the cold stone, running headlong toward the first light that she saw. Running without thinking of anything but finding a crowd and seeking shelter with people. She ran and slipped and heard him behind her and ran faster. She felt the cold stone under her shoes and her legs ached and she slipped again. Just as she felt him reach out to grab her, she heard a man shout. Halt! Who goes there? He shouted at her. He was blocking her path, and that of the Duke, who ran behind her. She blinked at him and, abruptly, she started to cry. She had been assaulted, chased and threatened. She was exhausted, desperate and frightened. The last, absolutely the last thing she needed was someone shouting at her about making a disturbance. Let me. Let me go past. She gasped. Go away. He's after me. Can't you see that? She heard the man draw in a breath. She realized they were standing in the darkened street and she could barely see his face. And that he could barely see hers. She looked up at him, now that her eyes were accustomed to the darkness, and gasped in shock. Lord Sutcliffe. You. Lord Sutcliffe exclaimed at the same time. His hair was ruffled and his face was red and his blue eyes were round with shock. Lady Amanda. He said. His arms wrapped around her in a hug and she collapsed against him. Unable to stand up a moment longer. He stroked her hair and spoke to her softly. His voice whispered soothing words in her rear as he held her close and Amanda allowed herself to rest and recover her breathing. What happened? He? He's chasing me. Amanda whispered. She felt Lord Sutcliffe stiffen. He turned around and she could feel his muscles bunching where he held her against his chest, ready for action. Who is? He asked her. Amanda looked around. The street was dark, illuminated only by a torch bracketed to the wall opposite them. She looked for the Duke, but she could see nobody in the shadows. Or in the square at the end of the street. Or in the alley she'd run down. The Duke had gone. She slumped back against the wall and started to cry again. The relief swept through her and suddenly she could hold back no more. What is it? Lord Sutcliffe asked gently. What happened? Tell me. Amanda drew in a hiccuping breath. The Duke of Avery. He? He ran out of the theatre after me. He was so, so. She didn't know what to say. She felt a flush of shame and she didn't want Lord Sutcliffe to know what had happened. He ran out of the theatre after you? Lord Sutcliffe asked. He was in the theatre with you? Amanda nodded, tears running down into the collar of her gown. He invited you to the theatre alone? Grandmother was there. But, but he insisted I sit beside him. She sniffed. He touched me. He was putting his hand on me all the time, and I couldn't bear it any more. I ran away, and... She started crying again, covering her face with her hands. Lord Sutcliffe was very quiet. As she stopped crying, Amanda looked up at him. His face was lit by the torchlight. She had never seen him so angry. If I see him, he's dead. 
he murmured. Amanda stared at him with surprise. Lord Sutcliffe? She whispered, amazed. I mean it. He had better stay away from you and from me. I'll kill him. Amanda felt herself shiver at the coldness of his words. She had never heard a note like that in anyone's tone before. And she gaped at hearing it from his mouth. She wrapped her shawl closer around her, realizing for the first time that it was icy cold outside. You need to get indoors. Lord Sutcliffe said. I can't take you into the club. Can I take you home? He asked softly. Please. She whispered, and she felt herself shivering. Please. I want to go home. Of course. Lord Sutcliffe said gently. We can hail a coach. It's not far. Thank you. She said. She clung to Lord Sutcliffe's arm as he walked carefully back to the square. She held tight to him. Half terrified that the Duke would suddenly appear out of the shadows and attack her. Take us to Foley House. He said, speaking to the driver of the coach who had halted a few paces away. Amanda swallowed hard and shut her eyes, feeling relief swamp her. She smoothed her hand down her skirt when she sat, noting that the fine silk was crushed and dust-covered. She shivered in the thin sleeves and wished she could warm up. Lord Sutcliffe stepped up and sat down opposite her and slammed the door. And she felt instantly warmer. Thank you. She whispered. You saved me. I wish I had been there earlier. I wish that had never had to happen. He ran a weary hand down his face. His eyes were sad. Amanda leaned forward, wishing she could take the pain out of his voice. It wasn't your fault. He smiled sadly. It certainly wasn't yours. That made her feel much better. They turned down two or three streets and then, before she could have expected it, they were stopping outside her house. She rested her head on the cushion and looked out of the window. Can I help you down? Lord Sutcliffe asked. Thank you. She whispered. He jumped down and she stepped out of the coach. He held her hand to help her up the steps and knocked at the door. Then Mr. Penning opened up and Lord Sutcliffe shot him a hard stare. Allow me to help Lady Amanda indoors. He said. She is very tired and in need of rest. My lord, this is most. The man began, but Lord Sutcliffe was looking at him so coldly that he stopped talking. He stepped aside and let the two of them go in together. I will wait in the house until your grandmother returns home, if you wish it. Lord Sutcliffe asked her gently as he helped her up the steps. Amanda shook her head instantly. No. No. Please. I will be quite well. She murmured. I am safe now. And. Thank you. She whispered. He smiled and took her hand, lifting it to his lips. I will always be pleased to serve you. He said. Amanda looked into those blue eyes and felt her mood soften. She smiled and nodded her thanks. I hope to see you soon she murmured. I will not have it otherwise. He bowed, and she opened the door to her bedroom and went inside. She shut the door and sat down heavily on the bed. Her legs hurt, her chest still burning from the exertion of the run. Her feet were raw and painful. Her reflection showed her hair tumbled down around her face. Her skin pale and streaked with crying. As soon as her maid came in, she drew in a gasp. Amanda shut her eyes. Please. Don't say anything. Just draw some hot water for me, please. She asked. She wanted to clean herself. To wash off the horror of the night. She would sleep so much better if she could do that. Of course. Her maid nodded. Amanda waited for the water, trying to calm down. She had already tried to push much of the horrible experience out of her mind. And she was resolved never to think of it again. 
The only thing she wanted to remember was Lord Sutcliffe and the care in his eyes. That was the only good thing about the entire occurrence. Chapter 14 Henry walked out of his bedroom and down to the dining room of the boarding house, feeling too tired to see his way. He also felt stiff with rage, which was all that kept him moving forward. He hadn't slept because he kept on seeing Amanda's terrified face. This was the last day he would wait before doing something to help her. Porridge, my lord? The owner of the boarding house asked him as she walked stiffly into the dining room. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Lawnsdale. He looked around the room. Two of the other guests were busy finishing their breakfast. Neither of them met his eye. He nodded his thanks to the boarding house owner as she put the bowl before him. And then started to eat. He felt sick and he didn't feel like breakfast, but he needed to keep up his strength. He was going to confront his father. I know he'll probably argue and try to force me to do as he wants. But I am not going to bow to his will. I will make my own life before I let him do this to us. He finished the porridge and pushed back his chair, then took his hat and coat from where they waited by the door and headed out into the cold London morning. He walked from the grubby street toward Anselm's house, passing the market where sellers cried out their wares, walking past the bakers and the tanners and all manner of other businesses and heading up toward Covent Garden. It was a long walk, and by the time he got there he was exhausted. He leaned against the wall, breathing heavily a moment. When he knocked at the door, Anselm's butler raised a brow. Henry was sure he looked a real mess. He'd been walking half the morning and he could feel sweat dripping down between his shoulder blades despite the chilly air. Is Lord Anselm in? He's in the parlour. The butler nodded. Shall I tell him you're here, my lord? Take me up to see him. Henry nodded. Anselm I made a choice. I am going to invest with your group. He said, the moment he walked into the room. Anselm stared. This is a surprise. He said with a grin. You had a sudden change of mind? Henry nodded stiffly. I can see no other way to obtain wealth fast. Splendid. Anselm grinned. Well. I'll inform the fellows at once. When would you like to conclude the matter? Soon. Henry said, aware he was making a swift decision. I intend to see my father this afternoon. Anselm raised a brow. As you wish. He nodded. We will convene here after lunch. Capital. Henry nodded. When business was concluded, a lengthy process that involved a trip to the solicitor's office. Henry thanked his friend and headed back to the boarding house. He washed and combed his hair, then took a hackney coach to Kensington, where his father's house was. Lord Henry The butler, Mr. Healy, said when he saw him. I didn't know you were here. Come up at once. His lordship will be delighted. Thank you, Healy he said thinly. He himself had no particular sense that his father would be pleased to see him. He won't be pleased with what I am going to say. He followed the butler upstairs and waited, feeling tense, as the butler went in to announce him. He had no idea what to expect. Lord Henry, my lord. The butler announced. Lord Sutcliffe stared around him at Henry, and then stood up, a big smile lighting up his face. Why, Henry? He beamed. You're here. That's a surprise. What brings you to London? You are well, I hope? There's no urgent reason for you to be here? His face rearranged into a frightened look. Henry frowned. No, father. No reason. I am rather surprised you're so astounded to see me. Did you not decree I was to come to London post-haste? His voice was cool. Why, no. His father frowned. Henry? Why would you say that? 
He was standing by the window, a perplexed frown creasing his brow. Henry stared. You threatened me. He blurted out. With disownment, if I didn't comply with your wishes and attend the season. Mother was very clear about it. Henry's father frowned. No, son. He said after a long moment. I would never have done this. Henry felt his legs shake and he groped for a chair before he fell. He was exhausted. He hadn't slept, and the walk through the streets had taken all his energy. This last shock was a load he couldn't bear. Mother said you agreed to disown me. He said. He heard how soft his own voice was. He was struggling with the possibilities that suggested. Why would his mother lie? But, if she hadn't lied, how was it that father knew nothing of it? His father came back to the big chair under the window and lowered himself to sitting. He leaned back. His brow was creased with a frown. He looked weary and concerned. Son. I do not know what happened. But I know I never said that. Your mother must be mistaken. Henry shut his eyes. He knew that his father was as upset as he was, and that he didn't want to believe ill of his mother. He took a breath. She might be. He said softly. He and his father looked at each other and Henry was touched by the care in his father's eyes. He leaned forward, elbow on his knee. His face was troubled. Son. You should have come to me. I would never say such a thing. Why would I want you to attend the season, anyway? He sounded incredulous. Yes, I know. Your mother has this notion that you need to find a dazzling match, but... Well he feel more inclined to let you make your own choice. What? Henry stared at him. He knew it was a rude thing to say. But he couldn't think of anything better in the moment. He was shocked. He had been led to believe that his father was as determined to keep him apart from the one woman he loved as his mother was. His father laughed. Son. You'll swallow a nut if you sit like that. Henry shut his mouth, which had been open with a gape of shock, and leaned back. I really believed you were against it. His father shut his eyes. I know. I did voice the opinion that maybe you would be happier in London. After all, there are so many people here. And I felt guilt at isolating you at Sutcliffe Manor. Yet, I know that you have made up your mind. You are. Well, you make up your mind fast. Like your mother. He grinned. Like me. Henry looked at him and a small smile lifted the corner of his mouth. Probably. Completely. His father countered. They both laughed. Henry felt sad, despite the levity of the moment. How could he have believed, even a second, in his father's disownment? He should have had faith in the love they shared. He looked down. He had believed his mother. He had believed she would not possibly lie to him. Son. We need to address this. His father said after a long moment. Your mother. I am sure her intention was good-natured. Henry looked at the mantle as he spoke, avoiding his father. I think mother has plans for me that she believes will make me happy. She hasn't realized that I know how to find happiness for myself. She isn't in charge of making me happy anymore. His father let out a breath. Well, sometimes I forget, too. He said with a sorrowful grin. It is tempting to believe one can make the special people in one's life happy. Henry nodded slowly. But sometimes, by doing so, you obstruct the very thing that is the source of their happiness. We cannot know another's heart. All we can do is trust that they will confide their most important secrets to us. His father nodded. They both sat silently for a while. The butler moved some things on the mantel next door. Someone else swept. The silence stretched between them. Henry shifted in his seat. Father, I should go. He said. 
I have some important things to do. His father stood too. Of course, son. He nodded. May I ask, are they things which will have long-reaching outcomes? One is. Henry said with a smile. I need to see Lady Amanda. His father just smiled sadly. Son, I hope you are aware that you have my complete agreement. Lord Foley would be glad, too, I think. Henry nodded. I believe so. They looked at each other for a long pause. Henry felt a deep sorrow. His father looked sad, but he also looked assured. Henry wished he hadn't had to tell him about the lie. But he would never have known of it had he not done so. I should have confronted him when I first arrived. It would have saved all of us so much difficulty. He pushed aside the thought and said his farewells. His father tried to persuade him to stay at Sutcliffe House. Henry eventually let himself be convinced, but only after he had gone to see Amanda. He waved to his father and headed down the steps, back stiff with resolve. He was aware that his father was not the only one who might get in his way, and that, if need be, they might still need to elope somewhere together. He smiled at the thought. This was the last time he was going to let circumstances and duty stop him doing anything. Chapter 15 Amanda went to the drawing room, walking quietly over the parquet floor. She had woken late and requested a tray be brought to her room. She felt the need to avoid company. I cannot stop feeling afraid. She tiptoed down the hallway and slipped into the drawing room. She jumped with surprise as she heard a clatter in the hallway. And then sat down on the chaise lounge, knees trembling with relief as the housekeeper wheeled a trolley past the door. I am so jumpy. She let out her breath in a long sigh. It was understandable, she thought. After all, her encounter with the Duke had been terrifying. And she was also afraid of her grandmother's anger. She recalled her words to her when she had returned. I do not wish to see you. She swallowed hard. Why is she so angry? She asked aloud. As if she had conjured her, she heard footsteps in the hallway and she looked up to see her grandmother. Grandmother? She said softly, getting to her feet. She didn't want to fight. She just wanted to shut the door of her bedroom and hide away and not see anybody. You disgraced me. Her grandmother began, and then held her hand up as Amanda cleared her throat, desperate to say something. You don't deserve it, but I have a mind to be lenient. She finished. Grandmother. I Amanda began. But again her grandmother interrupted. I kept you too innocent. It was my fault. You don't know what people will think when they know that you fled the theatre with a gentleman. They will think that you and he did things you should only do when you're wed. Grandmother. Amanda went red. She felt ashamed. She felt shocked. She had run away from the Duke because of that very reason and here her grandmother found it necessary to accuse her of that very thing. She felt her eyes fill with hot, angry tears. You see? I kept you too innocent. I am willing to see where I erred, as well as yourself. And that is why I have managed to broker a special agreement with the Duke. If you wed him within the week, he will make sure that any rumors are instantly discounted. Grandmother. Amanda vaulted out of her seat. She was too angry to keep silent longer. She was too hurt and too afraid to stay mute. You mean? He's horrible. He? You cannot do this to me. Grandmother, he tried to touch me. In the theater. That was why I ran away. She started to cry, tears pouring down her cheeks. She took a deep breath and tried to hold back her tears, but she couldn't stop them. She knew it was unladylike to cry so unrestrainedly but she was terrified. Please. She whispered. Grandmother, you cannot sell me to that. My child. She began. I understand he is not. What a gentleman should be. But. Well I. 
I'm doing this for your own good. You don't wish to know the fate of ladies who have done as all believe you did. Without the benefit of immediate conjugation. I have done my best for you, and I will not be contradicted. Amanda sat down on the chaise lounge, trying not to cry. She couldn't think or feel anything besides horror and emptiness. She looked up at her grandmother, who stood to her left. Child, I do understand your sorrow. Her grandmother said softly. I was worried when I was much younger than you, and I had barely met my husband. I know you are afraid. But I am doing you a favor. It is a grand match, and I know you will thank me. Amanda shut her eyes, because she knew that if she looked at her grandmother, if she remained aware of her a second more, she would start to cry. She couldn't find the words to explain what she wanted to say. The thing that the Duke had threatened to do to her, the way she felt when she was near him. She felt sick and she thought she might be sick. She shook her head. Please, grandmother. She whispered. Her grandmother coughed. Now, stop it, dear. She said, and she didn't sound particularly unkind. You have two days before a grand match happens. You don't want to be all teary and with a swollen face on your wedding day. Grandmother. Amanda stared at her. She couldn't mean. She couldn't. Her grandmother turned around and walked out of the room. Amanda leaned back and shut her eyes. She felt as if she was being condemned for something that wasn't her fault. She sniffed and tried not to break down. Maybe it wasn't true. Maybe it had somehow been her fault. Maybe she shouldn't have run away. Maybe she did exactly what the Duke had hoped she would. She stayed where she was until she heard the sound of the maid coming past to clean the room. Then she stood and went out to the stairs. She was sitting in her bedroom, her face washed. Trying to make sense of things, when someone knocked at the door. Yes? She asked, standing up at once and opening the door. Joanna was outside. Your grandmother is downstairs. You have a visitor. May I help style your hair? A visitor? Amanda frowned. Yes, please, do. She added, sitting at the dressing table. She waited while Joanna styled her hair. Then she ran down the stairs. She walked into the hallway and stared with horror. It was the Duke. He was wearing a suit and he smiled up at her. I thought I could not wait any longer. He said. She stared in horror as a man with spectacles turned to her and held out his hand. This is Mr. Pelham. He's here to discuss the contract with your grandmother. Since I understand your father has asked her to act in his stead. What? Amanda stared at him. He couldn't mean. You wish to discuss it now? Her grandmother asked. Even she looked somewhat disturbed. Seeing that made Amanda's heart jump, even though she still had no idea what was happening. Well, yes. The Duke said and looked over at Amanda in a way that made her turn away, wanting to be sick. I thought we could settle things so that we can make a quick business of it. Why the haste? Amanda's grandmother asked with a frown. I mean, you thought to wait a few days, did you not? A few days? Amanda had almost not believed her grandmother that he had asked for such haste. How could he do it? He smiled. I thought tomorrow seemed a better choice. The faster I settle this, the faster these nasty rumors are stopped. He smiled at them both in what Amanda assumed was meant to be friendly. Grandmother. I cannot. She whispered. Her grandmother nodded. Well, child. It's unusual, but everyone would understand. Private ceremonies are quite common nowadays. Amanda felt instantly frightened. She had been planning an escape, but now, suddenly, she had no time. She stared at her grandmother in horror, but she knew that there was nothing she could do to halt it. 
she could see her grandmother's expression was set. But she had to try. Grandmother, I cannot do this. She said again. Her voice was small, but she spoke forcefully. Please, grandmother. This man is ready to marry you, despite the rumors attached to your name by now. The duke said, finishing her sentence smoothly. Are we agreed? He added, looking over at her grandmother, who nodded. Yes, in absolute agreement. She said. She was whispering, and Amanda could see how distressed she was. That gave her some hope for her future. But she could also see her grandmother was not about to disagree with the duke. I cannot do this. She said, and this time she looked directly at the duke. You know the truth as well as I do. You know these rumors are lies. You could stop them. I could stop them, if I told the truth of what had happened. What you said. His brow went up. Amanda thought that she had managed to worry him. She felt a brief happiness, but then as his expression turned bitter, she realized that he was not about to let that happen. You have expressed the reason why we must make such haste. He said. One thing you will never do is spread slanderous tales of me. I think they would not be believed, should you choose to spread them or not. Amanda looked at her feet. She had played the strongest card she had. She didn't know what to say. She was still trying to think of something when the solicitor and her grandmother walked up the steps together. Shall we go and discuss the final details, then, Baroness? As she watched her grandmother and the solicitor go up the stairs to her study, Amanda felt sudden terror. She looked across to the door, but the duke was standing there as if he had positioned himself in front of it on purpose. And she knew that she had lost all chance to stop this. She could only wait to see what would happen next. Chapter 16 Henry ran up the steps to Foley House. He knocked breathlessly at the door. As soon as he had finished his conversation with his father, he had taken a coach back to the neighborhood. He had to see her. Please take my card to Lady Amanda. Henry said as the butler appeared around the door. Um. My lord the butler said carefully. I do not think it is the best time for you to visit here. Henry frowned. Something was not as it should be here, he could sense it. He could not imagine why the butler was being so standoffish, and it worried him a great deal. Why is that? He asked. Um. Well, my lord. It is a difficult moment. The butler said. The man looked awkward. Henry could not contain himself a moment longer. He felt his hand tighten on the frame of the door. He tried to keep the harsh note out of his voice when he addressed the man. Take my card to her, if you please. I am sure her ladyship will say if it is not an appropriate time for her to receive guests. The man made a face. I'll see what I can do, my lord. He headed into the house. Henry didn't like the agitation in the man's pose or his instant refusal. Something was wrong and he felt a desperate urge to walk straight past the man and into the house. To find Amanda and walk out of the door and never come back. My lord. The butler said, appearing again at the doorway. I apologize, but Lady Amanda cannot see you now. Henry blinked at him in astonishment. He had a strong sense that the man was lying. He had never been received in such a way and he couldn't put a finger on what it was. But something bothered him. Maybe it was that coach in the drive. Someone was here, parked in the narrow path that led up to the coach house around the side of the building. He didn't know why, but he didn't like the look of that coach. Is she here? He asked bluntly. Um. Yes, my lord. She is here. What is going on? Henry demanded. He drew a deep breath. Why would Amanda refuse to see him? It made no sense. He saw the man try to shut the door and he pushed it open. My lord. 
The butler exclaimed in horror, but Henry pushed straight past and walked briskly across the hallway. He looked around the place. He had no idea why he had just done what he did, but he felt real urgency possess him. He had to find Amanda. Something was bad and not as it should be. He ignored the butler's outraged shouts and headed across the hallway to the ballroom. There was someone talking in there. He could just hear the murmur of voices and he walked toward it. Determined to find out what was wrong. My lord. A voice shouted as he walked into the room. It was followed by a cry of astonishment. Lord Sutcliffe. Henry stared. The scene before him made no sense and then, suddenly, it made a terrible sort of sense. Amanda was standing by the side of a tall man with a heavy, suspicious face. He was holding her hand and he turned to look at Henry with a look of pure hate. Amanda ran to him. There were two figures by the door behind them. He thought they were her grandmother and Patricia. He barely looked at them. Lord Sutcliffe, you came. You are here just when I needed you. Henry reached out and wrapped his arms around her. She clung to him and he heard her crying. He looked up as the tall, angry-looking man came across to see him. Who are you? The man demanded of Henry. And, whoever you are, you can get out of here. Remove your hands from my betrothed. As the man spoke, face flushed and angry. He felt Amanda flinch at the sound of his voice before she looked across at him with bitter eyes. He tensed. He was angry before, but now he was furious. Amanda? He said softly, bending down to look at her. Amanda, dearest. Go upstairs. I will put this situation to rights. Henry. She murmured. Henry. Don't let him provoke you. She whispered. I don't want to leave you with him. Henry could see the man glowering at him. Henry was touched by Amanda's care for him. He ignored the Duke and spoke directly to Amanda, looking into her eyes. Amanda, go upstairs. I promise I won't do anything risky. Stay there until I come to find you. He felt her hand loosen in his, and she turned and walked to the door. Henry felt himself relax a little to see her safe. But he had barely a second to draw breath before the man advanced on him. Henry rooted himself to the spot, but the fellow grabbed his shoulder and shook him, taking his breath away. How dare you step in and think you can take what is mine by right? He shouted. He was a foot or two away from Henry's face, and the voice seemed to echo in his brain. How dare you? You scoundrel. I should take you to the watch. How dare you intrude? I have settled the details with her grandmother and my solicitor. The match is done. You have no right touching her. Henry felt his face go red. He lifted a hand and put it on the man's shoulder and pushed him back. He hadn't meant the motion to carry as much force as it did. But the fellow stumbled back, then roared at him. He pushed me. Did you see? You scoundrel. You come in here, and interrupt me, and then you insult me and attack me? It's to the watch with you. Henry felt as if the whole world had suddenly shifted and left him in some bizarre place. The voices around him were raised. He could hear the man, the other woman in the room. Amanda's grandmother, and, somewhere, Amanda's voice. Nothing anyone was saying seemed to make any sense to him, and it floated in through the haze gradually one piece of information at a time. The man was ranting at him, calling him names, s. Houting that he was going to call the watch on him. Henry just stared at him. He had no idea who he was. Though he thought he might have seen him somewhere before. Lady Foley, Amanda's grandmother, was taking him by the arm to restrain him. Come now, Lord Avery. Come now. You should not make a scene about it. That was the missing piece Henry needed. This was the Duke of Avery? The man who had touched Amanda. Who had frightened her, pursued her and threatened her. He felt his temper suddenly too large to contain a moment longer. You blackguard. He roared. 
He was amazed by the sound of his own voice. He had never been so angry in his life, and he felt like he was floating above the scene. Hearing himself saying things he hadn't thought but absolutely meant. You will face me in a duel for what you did to Amanda. I will defend her honor. As he shouted it, all the noise in the hall suddenly went quiet. Nobody said anything. Amanda sobbed. He turned to wrap her in his arms, but Lord Avery strode over toward him. He did not try to touch him. But Henry could read anger in every line of him. I will face you in a duel. The man hissed. Pistols. At first light in the morning. By the ruins of Thornfield Hall. Henry swallowed hard. He would have rather preferred swords he had more practice with them but it was tradition that the person challenged would choose the weapons, and he couldn't argue. He nodded. As you wish. He looked around to where Amanda was staring at him. Her eyes were wide and she looked horrified. She wasn't saying anything, but he could see she was close to tears. He looked away. He had promised her he wouldn't do anything dangerous, and he had failed to keep that promise. He felt light-headed. Gentlemen. Lady Foley said. She sounded quite distressed, but Henry was too tired to think about anything. We should not be two of you hasty. Should you not reconsider? Henry stared at Lady Foley in shock. She had known about this. And now when she could see how desperate Amanda was to escape it. She really thought the wedding should continue? Henry looked at Lord Avery, who looked back at him. He didn't know what to say. After a long moment, the man cleared his throat. I will see you tomorrow at dawn. Lord Avery said, giving him a threatening look. Henry nodded, feeling too tense to do anything else. Even to feel particularly afraid. He was far beyond feeling fear. He knew the Duke had a reputation with pistols. And that his friends, who would be his seconds, had an equally ferocious one. But he felt a strange, blank indifference. He would fight the man, and that was all there was to it. He had to and that was the greatest extent of how he felt about it. No fear, no anger, no particular concern. He heard the Duke push past him and head toward the door, but he didn't look to see him go. He looked across at Lady Foley and her maid, who were both staring at him in astonishment. Then he heard Amanda, who ran to him and wrapped her arms around him. Henry! She whispered. Please, don't do this. He'll kill you. Henry looked down into her eyes, and he felt his own heart melt. He wished Lady Foley and the other woman were not there. Because he longed to kiss her. He held her in his arms and smiled at her. I won't let him. He said gently. She smiled at him and he held her and then, wishing he could stay but knowing he could not, he took a step back and gently disentangled himself from her embrace. He bowed to her and turned around and then hurried away. Before he succumbed to temptation and stayed there. He had things to prepare at home before the duel. Chapter 17 Amanda looked out of the window. She had barely slept. She was not eating breakfast, but instead she had gone directly to the drawing room. Where the windows faced the east, she could see the barest glimmer of light on the horizon. I need to go to Thornfield now. She heard footsteps in the hallway. Joanna was there. She cleared her throat. My lady, you need to eat something. Won't you come to the breakfast room? Lady Foley is still there. Amanda felt her body stiffen. She was angry with her grandmother. She didn't want to see her. She might act as if she was shocked by this business, but, if she had simply let Amanda denounce Lord Avery. Or at least if she had taken Amanda's opinion on him seriously. This would not have happened. I don't wish to take breakfast. She said softly. Joanna went out through the door again. As you wish, my lady. Amanda stayed where she was. She had ordered the coach to be ready, though it was only five o'clock in the morning. 
nobody in the house had slept, and she was not surprised that her grandmother was also awake. She wondered what the servants thought about it, though she was sure they all knew about the duel. The whole of London must know by now, she thought. And with some luck, somebody might try to stop it. Dueling was frowned on in the highest circles, though that hadn't done much to dissuade anyone. She turned around as she heard another noise in the hallway. Joanna came in, carrying a plate with some pastries and a cup of tea. Thank you. Amanda whispered, feeling touched. She barely knew Joanna, but clearly they had some sort of friendship. She smiled at the younger woman appreciatively. Joanna had been right. The pastries and tea did make her feel much better. She felt less tired, though the hideous unreality of it all had still not quite sunk in. She heard feet in the hallway and turned to find her grandmother at the door. I will come with you. Lady Foley said. She had clearly been distressed, and her face was tense and careworn. I feel responsible for this, Amanda. I need to be there. Amanda just looked at her. She couldn't quite forgive her grandmother, she had been responsible for the duel completely. And she knew that, should anything happen to Henry, she would have to go away. She wouldn't be able to look at Lady Foley ever again. Amanda. I did not mean for things to happen as they did. Lady Foley said softly. I wish they had not. Amanda could hear the distress in her voice. She nodded. I know you did not want this to happen. She said, and stood and walked to the door. Without saying anything, she walked down the steps into the entrance. And she heard her grandmother follow her. She didn't turn around, but walked out to the coach. When she had alighted, she looked out of the window and was surprised to see Patricia and her grandmother, both walking down the path. Patricia didn't look at her but got into the coach after their grandmother had alighted. Amanda glanced at Lady Foley, who shrugged. She feels like it's her fault this duel is happening. Because without her you wouldn't have met the Duke in the first place. She asked to come. She said. I know. I think it's foolish, too. It's not your fault, child. She added, turning to Patricia with a frown. Patricia just looked at her wordlessly. She was white and silent, her face expressionless. She didn't look at Grandmother, but kept on gazing ahead into the coach. Amanda looked at her sister, feeling a wash of compassion flow through her. They had barely spoken since her father's illness, and her sister's care surprised her. She did look stricken with shock. She leaned forward as the coachman set the coach pulling out into the street. The country around Thornfield had a desolate air. Amanda shivered as the coach stopped near the hall. It was an old, ruined place. People said it had belonged to someone killed for treachery two hundred years ago, and that nobody had lived there since. She drew her cloak around her as she looked up at the ruin. She could believe the tales of the place. It felt abandoned. She jumped down from the coach and drew her cloak about her. The sky was grey, the mist shutting out the dawn. The ground below her feet was soaked with dew, and she could feel it dampening the hem of her dress. She walked forward, knowing that she was being followed by the others from the coach. But feeling as if she was utterly alone. Henry. Please, be safe. She walked across the grass to the field where the duel was to take place. When she got there, she spotted the shadowed figures of men in the mist. Two of them seemed to be pacing out a distance, while a third held a book. Two others stood to the side. Amanda scanned the group and spotted Henry. He looked over at her. She felt her chest take with feeling. His blue eyes had so much care in them, and so much sorrow. His lips lifted at the corners in a smile. His eyes were full of pain, and Amanda fought the urge to run to him. She looked across the field at him and he looked at her. And it felt as if the world was empty of everyone but the two of them and the love in Henry's eyes. Please, let him live. She looked away. The third man. The one who had held a book. 
had started to call instructions. The other four men stopped what they were doing and looked up to listen to him. Amanda caught sight of Duke Avery, standing on the other side of the field, just appearing through the mist. She ignored him. Gentlemen. The man shouted. He had a cool but somehow authoritative voice, a thin face, and pale hair. My lords, you will fire from twenty paces, on my signal. If you will begin pacing out the distance, your seconds have already marked it out for you. Amanda watched as Henry turned and started to walk away. No, she wanted to shout. No, please don't. She watched as his dark curls headed down toward the manor. He was in the south and a little east. The rising sun had a risk of throwing his aim. She did not look as Lord Avery paced away from them, heading to the trees. She did not want to think of him. She could feel her grandmother and Patricia standing close. She wondered if, when the mist cleared completely, they would see other people who had come to watch the duel. She hoped not. On your marks, gentlemen. The tall man shouted. Get set. Amanda heard the sound of the pistols being made ready to fire. She knew very little about guns, since it was all gleaned from hearsay and that mostly from her riding teacher. But she did recognize that horrid sound. She shut her eyes and felt her grandmother take her hand. She wanted to refuse, but she curled her fingers around hers. She stared into the fast clearing mist. Henry, don't let yourself be blinded. Aim true. And? Go. The man yelled. Amanda stifled a scream as shirts ripped through the silence of the morning. She heard a man cry out, and she stared. In horror, as Henry stumbled back. She couldn't stand still anymore. She ran forward, running to him as he stepped back. Henry. She screamed. Henry. She didn't care if anyone was there to see her. She didn't care anymore if it might be thought improper. She ran to him and held him in her arms and looked into that handsome, wonderful face. What if he was wounded? Where was he wounded? She felt her fingers twist where they gripped his sleeves. Anselm? A voice called from the other side of the field. Come over here. This man's wounded. I'm coming, Rackford. The tall, pale-haired man who had read the instructions called in reply. Amanda watched as he walked away. He was heading down toward the other side of the field. The other side. Lord Avery is. She whispered, as the meaning of that finally worked through. He is wounded, yes. Henry said, and looked down into her eyes. You mean Amanda said, and suddenly she couldn't stop smiling. You're unhurt? But what? The gun has a bit of a recoil. He said with a smile. Amanda started laughing. Relief made everything seem bright and wonderful, and she looked up at him and rested her hands on his shoulders. He looked down into her eyes and she felt her body melt as he kissed her where her hair met her brow. He looked down into her eyes and he was about to say something else, when somebody called them from the other side of the field. Henry. Can you come here a moment? The tall, authoritative sounding man called out to him. Beckoning him to where his second, Rackford, was standing under a tree. Even over the distance, she could see he was smiling. Amanda looked at Henry, heart soaring. And together they walked to the other side of the field. Amanda was happier than she could remember, and she looked through the mist confidently. Knowing that, whatever else happened, nobody could believe anyone calling her honor into question again. Chapter 18 Amanda looked down at Duke Avery. He had stumbled to his feet and was leaning back on the fence. One of the men, his second, she guessed, held a handkerchief to the wound in his shoulder, which was bleeding strongly. The other headed down the field. I'm going to call a physician. He called. Amanda looked at Duke Avery. 
He was staring at her, and he clearly had something to say, though he was in no shape to say it just then. After a long moment, he drew in a breath. I would never have done this. He hissed. I would not have risked my life for a flighty piece like this one. He tossed a hand out at Amanda, but he was not speaking to her. Clearly, his eyes focused on someone just behind her. I wouldn't have done it. Not if you had not told me that she would succumb to me eventually. Amanda stared in shock. She turned around, and was shocked to see Patricia. Her sister was looking at the man with wide eyes. She was white, her expression one so horrified that Amanda was sure she wasn't acting. She saw her grandmother stare with shock. What? What did you say to him? Henry demanded of Patricia, who was standing as still and silent as a post. His voice was hard. Amanda looked up at Henry, warning him to go easy. Patricia was her sister, after all. Her sister looked at him. Amanda thought she was too frightened to speak, but then she cleared her throat and started talking. I... I said that, yes. I didn't mean... I didn't want this to happen. Please. I didn't. I didn't. She started to sob piteously. Amanda felt her own heart twist. She needed to hear the rest of the story, but she could not bear to see Patricia so sad. She went to her. You said that she was pretending. That she wanted me, that she spoke of me. That if I took her to the opera, she would give in to me. The Duke hissed. You said that she was happy to be courted by me. But was pretending otherwise. To try to increase my interest. Amanda looked at the Duke, who was shouting now. She felt horror. Was that true? Had Patricia really orchestrated everything? She looked at her sister. She could see her grandmother on the edge of the small group, clearly desperate to try and get them to come home. She ignored her entreaties to go back to the carriage. She looked at her sister. Is what he is saying the truth, Patricia? I must know. Her sister looked at her, and Amanda knew that it was. At least partly. She had never seen Patricia look so contrite or upset before. She nodded. I did. I did what he said that I did. Patricia said awkwardly. Though I didn't use exactly those words, not exactly. But I. Conveyed. That you were interested in him, yes. I think I hoped it was true. Patricia whispered. With you gone. Then I could settle down and father would be all mine. And Lady Sutcliffe would make Henry court me instead and everything would be exactly as it had been before. You would go away and my family would be back to being just mine. And when father got better he would love me again. Amanda shut her eyes. Had her sister really felt so deserted by father? She hadn't known. She felt suddenly as if she should have seen the signs much earlier. As if she could have prevented all of this if she'd paid more attention to those sullen, hate-filled glances. Patricia, you didn't need to do this. Amanda said softly. Father loves you. He always has. I love you and grandmother does too. Nobody ever thought I replaced you. She looked over at her sister, who was looking at the field. She knew everyone was still there with them. But it felt as if it was only the two of them, and the silent, mist-filled space around them. Patricia, when father gets better, we will talk to him. Tell him how you feel, and I know he'll try to make sure you know how much he loves you. You should not have done what you did. Two men could have died as a result of the lie you told. I know. Patricia said softly. She looked scared and deeply upset. I didn't mean that. Please, I didn't know that something like that could happen. Amanda nodded. She still felt sick. Patricia could not possibly have known that a duel would result from her actions. She had known, though, that she would be forced to marry the Duke. Amanda could only hope Patricia had no idea of just how terrible a fate she had wished on her. I do not think she truly understood what would have happened to me. 
She saw only the chance to get rid of me and her father for herself once more. She swallowed hard. She looked at Patricia. Spoiled, she certainly was. Aloof to the feelings of others she also often was. But actually cruel and calculating? She couldn't believe that. Sister, you are sorry for what you did, aren't you? She asked gently. Patricia sniffed. Amanda, I wish I hadn't said that. I didn't want Lord Sutcliffe getting hurt. I didn't want you to get hurt, either. I thought you might like being a duchess, once you got used to the idea. She looked up at her hesitantly. Amanda swallowed hard. She could actually believe Patricia was that innocent. She had no idea what she had subjected her to that night at the opera. She nodded. I know. She said gently. You would have wanted that, and you thought I would want to be a duchess, too. Isn't that right? I think we should go back now. She added. She glanced at her grandmother. And maybe we could consider returning to Foley Manor? I am sure my father has need of us. Her grandmother turned away without meeting her eye. I will see what can be done. She said. Amanda and Henry walked back to Anne the field together. The physician had arrived, and his seconds and Lord Anselm had helped the Duke into his coach. They were the only people on the field. She closed her fingers around his. I can't believe you're safe. She whispered. And that it's settled. We can return to the country, and... Henry smiled down at her as she went crimson. Yes. He said softly. I have spoken to my father, and he believes your father will be very pleased to hear our plans. Amanda almost stopped breathing, her emotions were so strong. She looked up at Henry, and he smiled down at her. Yes. He said softly. I know what I want. I want to have you in my life forever. I want to spend every waking moment in your company, and I don't want to lose another day. Amanda smiled up at him and felt her heart flip over. She nodded. I want that too. She whispered. They were off the field, now, standing by the fence near where the coach was stopped. Amanda felt his hands rest on her shoulders and he bent down and pressed his lips to hers. She shut her eyes and felt his lips on her own. The soft touch of them making her belly tingle with longing. He gently moved his lips over hers, and then his tongue slid between them and he drew her close. She felt his hard, lean body press hers. And she wrapped her arms around him and held him tight. She never wanted to let him go. He stepped back and she could hear his breath gasp in his throat. My lady, he said softly. May I escort you to the coach? Amanda smiled up at him, and he took her hand and walked with her to the carriage. I will see you in town? She said softly, as he took her hands and looked into her eyes. Now that he was safe, now that they were safe, she was determined not to let him out of sight. He grinned. You will see me as soon as you get back. He said. And then we can all discuss returning home. Amanda nodded, as they would not have to stay in town a moment longer. Chapter 19 The coach stopped at Foley Manor. Amanda looked at Patricia, who sat across from her. They had spoken for many hours the previous evening. And Amanda felt as if they trusted each other in ways that they had never done before. She also felt as if she understood Patricia better. She could see the fear on her face as the coach pulled up. We can go up together. She said. Patricia nodded. I have to see father. Amanda took her hand and, as soon as they were out of the coach, they walked briskly up the stairs together. No need for haste. Their grandmother reminded them as they ran up the steps. But they did not stop and ran up the stairs and to his bedroom door. How is he? Amanda demanded of the butler, who was coming out with clean flannels and a tray. He is resting. Can he talk? Patricia asked. 
Her face was lit with hope. He frowned. Better than before, Lady Patricia. He bowed and headed to the top of the steps. May I summon the physician? He could inform you of his condition. Send for him in an hour. Amanda called down. She took Patricia's hand and together they walked into the bedroom. Amanda's eyes moved to the bed. She saw her father was sitting up, and then she saw how his eyes widened and he stared at them. He was grinning and she thought first of all that he looked happier than she had ever seen him. Daughters. He greeted, and he held out one arm, beaming as if he had never seen a finer sight. My daughters. There you are. You're back. Amanda and Patricia ran to him and both sat down on the bed together. Amanda stifled her tears as he reached for them and wrapped one frail arm around each of them. Father. She whispered. We were so worried. Papa. You're well. Patricia said. Amanda wanted to cry with happiness. They were all together. And it was, after all, so obvious they were both his beloved daughters. She sat back, feeling how weak her father's arm was. It has been the one he was unable to move. And it fell back to his side, almost as if he could barely move it yet. She looked over to where Patricia was sitting on the bed, holding his hand happily. Father. We went to London, but it wasn't fun at all, and we missed you. We are so glad to be back. Amanda felt an ache in her chest as her father smiled, and patted her shoulder. My sweet child. I am so glad to see you both. Amanda beamed at him and they shared a special smile. Where's your grandmother? He asked her. I need to speak with her. You didn't run away and leave her stuck in London? Amanda and Patricia both giggled and her father smiled. This close, she could see that his mouth still could not move as well on her side as it could on the other. His speech was also slurred, but understandable. Already, he seemed so much better. She nodded. Grandmother is here. She said softly. Would you like me to fetch her for you? He nodded. Yes. I must speak with her now. Girls, why don't you go upstairs? There's tea in the drawing room. Go and eat your fill. I will ask my manservant to help me upstairs in a moment. Amanda looked at Patricia, who was glowing with happiness. Yes, Papa. She nodded. We'll save some cake for you. Amanda felt her heart twist. Her father just smiled. They both knew he was quite far from well enough for cake, but Amanda suspected he would try. Even if he wasn't ready for it. She squeezed his hand. I'll fetch grandmother now. She said. She went up to the drawing room after calling their grandmother. Patricia was upstairs, chattering away to the maid about how they had not found any diversion in London. And how glad she was to see Papa again. Amanda felt sure she couldn't eat anything. She was tense and restless, but she sipped at the tea, and it soothed her. She was looking out of the window when her grandmother came to the door. Amanda? May I speak with you a moment? Amanda nodded. She glanced at Patricia, who nodded to her amicably. Then she followed her grandmother to the small parlor next door. My child, I spoke with your father. I told him. A truncated version of the events that occurred in London. Amanda nodded. She wondered which parts her grandmother had left out, but she didn't ask and her grandmother continued. I informed him of your interest in Lord Sutcliffe, and he... Well, he condoned the match. He and the Earl have always been friends. And, well, he said he was happy with it. Amanda nodded slowly. She felt light-headed, as if nothing in the world made sense just then. She was listening to her grandmother accepting her words, but her mind was elsewhere. Still drifting in a haze of wonderment. Henry and I are free to love one another. The rest of the day passed in a dreamy haze. She talked with her father, who told her he was very happy for her. 
She walked with him in the gardens for a while, and then Patricia came to join them. And she took him at a slow, easy walk up to the stream. Amanda watched them. Her father leaning heavily on his young daughter's arm. And wondered how Patricia could ever have thought their father did not love her. She glanced across the field toward where the sunlight shone on the hillsides, just close to setting. And felt her lips lift in a smile. Soon it would be tomorrow. Chapter 20 Amanda felt her maid place the veil on her head. It was attached to a wreath of orange flowers, and Amanda lifted her hand to delicately set the wreath on her own hair. I am ready, Maddie. She said to her maid with a small smile. Her maid, who was standing behind her, looking at them both in the big looking glass, smiled. You look grand, my lady. And now you'd better get downstairs. The carriage is waiting. Amanda looked down at her skirts, which shone silkily in the morning light. They were white silk, falling from a high waist. The neckline was oval, the sleeves puffed. Her hair was loose, the curls only slightly emphasized by brushing around a wooden cylinder. Just as she liked it. She grinned at her maid, took a deep breath, and walked down the stairs. Amanda. A voice called, and she looked up as she crossed the entrance. Patricia was there. She was wearing a dress of blue muslin, and she passed her a handful of lavender. Your bouquet. For good blessings. She said. Thank you. She said softly. The two sisters shared a smile. Come, my child. You don't want to keep Lord Sutcliffe waiting. Her grandmother said. Amanda turned to find her standing behind her. She was dressed in plum, her grey hair pulled back in an elegant up style. She smiled. I won't keep him waiting, grandmother. She nodded. She went out to the coach. Her father beamed at her as she climbed up. They waited for grandmother and Patricia, and then they headed off. They would marry in Hillcrest Village, the one nearest to the estate where all the Foley children had been baptized. Amanda watched the country slide past, her stomach tied in a knot of excitement. They reached the village sooner than she had expected, and she stared out with amazement as the church appeared. They would soon be inside, and everything felt slightly strange. As if it could not possibly be happening. It was just wonderful. Easy, milady. The coachman said, as he took her hand and helped her down. Amanda stepped down onto the cobbles, feeling lost in a haze of wonder. She waited for the rest of her family to alight, and then she took her father's arm and they walked to the church together. He walked very slowly, one halting step after another. He was walking, though. And her spirit soared and filled with joy to see it. They moved down the island into the church. Amanda felt her heart twist with wonder as they walked in. And the front of the church became clearer and clearer as they went. She spotted Henry, and then she could look nowhere else. When she reached his side, she could feel the warmth of his body beside her. She could hear the priest saying words, but none of that seemed to reach her. All she knew, all she was aware of, was Henry in his dark suit beside her, looking at her with his beautiful blue eyes. The point came where they made their vows. Amanda cleared her throat and said her vows clearly. And heard Henry say his, too, his voice resonant and filling her with love. Then, before she had imagined it, Henry was turning to her and, gently, tenderly, he was lifting the veil from over her face. She looked up into his eyes and felt her own damp with tears. He bent down and pressed his lips to hers. And she wrapped her arms around him and held him close. She felt his lips move on hers, his tongue flickering gently over her mouth before withdrawing. And she felt her heart melt. She looked into his eyes and was sure her own were shining with love. They walked down out of the church, where Lord and Lady Sutcliffe stood. Amanda stiffened. Henry had told her of the trouble Lady Sutcliffe had caused for them. And she had no expectations of the woman being kind. She curtsied and Lord Sutcliffe beamed. I am pleased you're part of the family, 
Amanda. She smiled into those kindly eyes, feeling her whole being fill with love. She had not expected such kindness from him, and it meant a great deal to her. Thank you. She said softly. Lady Sutcliffe said nothing, but she did return Amanda's greeting. It is a start. Shall we, my dearest? Henry asked her. He took her hand and they walked together across the paved street, past the crowds of townsfolk cheering and shouting greetings, and to the open coach which was waiting for them. Henry helped her up, and then got up to sit beside her. She looked out at the crowd and spotted her grandmother and her father, and Patricia. They were all smiling. And she waved to them and they waved back. And the villagers shouted and blessed them and Amanda looked away. Feeling her heart melting with joy. I can't believe it. Henry said, grinning at her as the coach headed off down the path out of the village. Amanda grinned at him. I can. She said softly. He laughed. I suppose you always were rather more pragmatic than I. She giggled. I don't know about that. You were the one who was so casual when you ran me off the path that first day. Henry laughed. You never have forgiven me. Well, I hope you know it was the best day of my life. Because it was the day I met you. I love you. Amanda looked at him. She felt her heart fill with love and she smiled at him. Her being light with joy. I love you, Henry. She said softly. I love you so much. He took her hands in his. He leaned forward. She leaned forward, and they kissed. Epilogue Amanda walked down the steps and into the garden. Sutcliffe Manor was situated on the warm side of the hill and the garden that grew around the manor was a profusion of color. It was early summer, and Amanda leaned against the wall, taking a chance to look out over the beautiful view. Amanda? She heard Henry come down the stairs and turned and looked up at him. A smile on her face. She took a deep breath, as always when she looked at him. He was so good-looking he almost stunned her sometimes. Dearest. She said. She took his hand and they stood together, looking out over the garden. Henry's hand was warm and gentle on hers. And Amanda looked up at him, feeling her heart ache with love. He kissed her as she turned to face him. And she rested her hand on his shoulder, looking up into his beautiful blue eyes. It's lovely already. Henry said, as he turned to look over the garden. He held her hand and they looked over it together the irises and early roses already blossoming. It was a warm spring, indeed, and the lawn was green and the trees covered in fresh leaves. It is. Amanda agreed. She frowned. I hope it is not too hot for me later on. Henry smiled. You mean? Yes. She said, and felt her cheeks heat with warmth. It won't be that comfortable when I'm big with child. Henry smiled at her with such tenderness that she felt love flood her being. I am sure we can try to make it as reasonable as possible. He promised. It is cooler out of the valley. We could go to the hill cottage. Amanda smiled fondly at him. I am sure it will be just as comfortable here. She assured him. He was so considerate it made her smile sometimes just to hear him say such things to her. And everyone's here. Henry nodded and smiled. Her family was close, and Amanda was comforted by the thought of having her father close by. He visited them often. She glanced out over the garden, and caught sight of him walking down the path. He was getting much better at walking, and he made sure to exercise every day. Especially when he was here. His arm was regaining its use too, and the whole family delighted in his progress. My father must be in his study, then. Henry observed with a grin. If their fathers weren't walking in the garden together, that would mean his own father was upstairs, devoting himself to his interest in ships. He seemed to know an inordinate amount about them. 
and his investments in the merchant trade were paying off. Yes, he must be. Amanda nodded. It's a good thing you got him interested in the shipyards as a way to make money. Henry smiled. I might have been the first person to put money in, but he knows so much already. He advises me more. Henry and his father had managed to make quite a lot of wealth following Henry's initial investment. And both their estates and the surrounding villages had benefited. I am sure. Amanda nodded. She thought she saw the Dowager Countess, Lady Sutcliffe, on the terrace. She stiffened slightly. Lady Sutcliffe was always a little formal with her. But they were getting to know each other slowly. Lady Sutcliffe had accepted the match, and Amanda thanked Grandmother for that. Amanda knew Lady Foley had worked hard, and had used all her persuasive talent to bend Lady Sutcliffe toward her current state of acceptance. Amanda looked up at Henry and felt her heart fill with love as he smiled down at her. Shall we go back to the house? She asked as she looked up at him. He nodded. Yes. Let's. It's getting cooler. He looked down into her eyes. And Amanda felt her soul fill up with love in the way that it always did when she looked at him. She smiled, and he smiled. And he bent down and kissed her on the lips. She looked into his eyes and he whispered her name. Amanda. I love you. She smiled up at him. I love you, too. She said. He bent and kissed her again. A swift, sweet motion. And together they went through the wide doors and into the warm parlor. The end. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube.